uh, we've just started working with communities of practice. This is the example of the one in Africa, uh, and we're about to start one in Latin America, and soon we'll do one in, in Asia, and, in, 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 and it's really getting people together on a monthly basis to talk about quality and safety in their areas, in their context, and getting us to understand how to make that easier for, for them to adapt and apply, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, quality and safety has come a long way over the last 20 years. Now, it's hard to believe that uh, we're in 2017, that if you go back 20 years, we were not talking about patient safety. Uh, it's hard to believe that in my lifetime, I was a doctor before patient safety was actually a science in its own right, with ways to do it. Now that is quite strange for me because when I was graduated as a pediatrician, uh, graduated as a doctor in 1979, I put my hand up like this and swore to do no harm. First, do no harm. In 1979, when I became a doctor, we had actually no idea how much harm we were doing. There were no studies. The first studies really came in the 1990s. There were early ideas but the idea that we harm up to 10 to 15% of every patient's admission to hospital worldwide, doesn't matter where you are, where every study worldwide is between 10 to 15%. Whether you're in India, the USA, in Ireland, in UK, wherever you are, it's in that range. And that's the one that we know. So <laughs> it's much higher than that. So it's hard to believe now, of course, uh, when you hear later for our last speaker, if he got 10% of his meal deliveries wrong, people wouldn't be very happy with him. <laughs> so we get 10% wrong, and yet people still come to our hospitals. So it's, but it's hard to believe that that happened. So after the last 20 years, a lot has happened and in this field. And of course, quality improvement was never a subject at all. Even nowadays, it's very rare. So what has happened? We have very powerful methods for improving healthcare. We have, um, we have some improvements that have been taken to scale in different countries. Uh, we've had a lot of improvements across socioeconomic and cultural contexts uh, around the world, and a lot of good examples. Uh, we are developing expertise, and I can see that in the room, and everyone here is an expert to a different degree and quality improvement safety. We have lots of methods and tools for improvement and tools for quality and safety, like all the, all the bundles and so on. And as you heard yesterday from Dr. Reddy, there's standards, standards, process, and we're even now getting standard operating procedures to do things correctly to improve outcomes. So all of these things have happened, but the question is, if that's the case, why do we still harm 10 to 15% of patients? Uh, an interesting paper recently by Vincent and Moverti says, well, we're, we're defining harm a little differently. So, for example, when I trained, nine infections were not harm, they were a consequence or a complication. And now we see them as harm. So, this quote from Margaret Chen is very revealing uh, because the reality is very straightforward. We have power of existing interventions but the power of the health system to deliver them is inadequate, basically. Health systems just don't have the power to implement at scale what we know. In fact, Jim Kim says that, uh, that there have been enormous investments made in global health. So we, sh should have, we should really expect from this investment great results, but we really haven't focused on the complexity of delivering health care to keep people healthy. Most of the interventions in patient safety and quality have been in disease management rather than in healthcare. And really we need to look at healthcare rather than disease management in the long term. So this is the question I'm going to ask and hopefully answer. Why do improvements work in one setting and not in another? And the second question is, uh, two questions part of that is how can we take what works in one context and apply it to another, and particularly for countries like India, how do we spread from a high resource to a low resource setting? And you heard this yesterday, how can we make what happens in a hospital like Apollo 
which is relatively high resource, work in a community clinic or hospital in a small rural village where they don't have the same resource. And that is a big challenge for wor us worldwide. So what is context? <laughs> Basically, it's all the factors that are not part of the quality improvement intervention itself. So for example, if we know that um, uh, to decrease uh, morbidity in surgical procedures, you need to do the surgical checklist. So this is well proven. It was actually studied in India as well as studied in the USA. So we know all we need is the surgical team to do that checklist at the start. Sounds very simple, but it's very complex because there are all the other things, the culture, the resources, the people, the procedures, the demands, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are in addition to that event. So context is really moving from efficacy to know what works to finding how does it work in my own environment, in my own situation. And that is really what we're looking at. Um, the overriding rule of context is that uh, context is uh, going a long way to explain why things don't work, but there hasn't been much study on context in itself, and it's only recently that people are studying it. So this is one of the, of the studies from Mary Dixon Wood, who studied the biggest failure, one of the biggest failures contextually. In Michigan, they decided to eliminate line infections. So Peter Fonovas published this paper on how they eliminated uh, line infections in intensive cares throughout the state of Michigan. So it was read by the NHS, and they thought this is a very good idea. And then what they happened is that they um, they then uh, rolled it out, and lo and behold, it failed in the UK. The intervention was clear. In fact, as a line bundle, the, the venues looked the same, but as a different country, it didn't work. So she says we need to have practical wisdom in studying and understanding. We have to really what they call practical wisdom. And this practical wisdom is a trade-off between explicitness of the actual intervention and the flexibility of how to adapt it where you go. So again, Mary Dixon Woods says when the intervention works, does not work, either it didn't work in the first place, so people weren't really reporting the efficacy, or it was uh, the intervention in a new place is not the same as the intervention in the old place. Even if it looks the same, it's not the same. Or the new place is so different to the first place that the intervention wouldn't work in the first place in that new place. Sounds interesting. Uh, or some kind of combination. So they really got to understand why things don't work when you move it. Now, I was very privileged last year to spend some time um, at, um, in Salzburg, at a Salzburg Global Summit run by Rashad Massoud uh, from USAID. And, um, and basically what we were looking at is how do we spread context. And if you look at the, the actual instance, you have an intervention, you have a theory of change, uh, but context is in the middle. Uh, what works and what doesn't work and how we have to work it. So this is the, the model we think that you have to do to study context. And these will all be published in the ISCO journal in the next two months. <coughs> so the theory of change is actually uh, something like, uh, this is a profound theory from Deminard's adapted, is really understanding the system you work and the variation, but most importantly is the, is the quadrant that says, examine the ways people think, their beliefs and attitudes, because that is really what context is about. So if you're going to adapt anything you've heard today or yesterday from any of the international speakers or from anyone who has done it in Mumbai and now you want to do it in Delhi or you want to do it in Chennai or in Bangalore, you have to ask, ask these four questions. What's our system? What's the variation? But more importantly, what do people believe? Because that is what's going to happen to adapt to context, because people's beliefs are so very important. And so on scale up, this is now based on Duran, is that when you plan in uh, your, your context, and if you were going for accreditation, your quality controls and safety controls, or that's where you're looking at it. But context is the most important factor. 
often this is not thought about within the system. So context is something you have to do, and these last two slides, I'd say, are something that you can adapt for yourselves and just ask these questions wherever you go. Uh, do we have a plan? How are we going to measure? Are we going to manage it? And how are we going to improve in our context? Because often what we say, you can't do in your context, so you have to adapt how you measure. So for example, people say, oh, you need to have an SPC chart or a run chart, but you might have a safety cross or a different way of measuring in your context. So this is very important, these principles to scale up. Uh, this is a little more complicated. Uh, this comes from a paper by uh, Overright, and uh, Overright, who was at Salzburg, and basically, as you can see on the, on the left, your right-hand side, uh, you have, you have the, uh, the actual intervention, then you see the adaptations, and then it's all specific to context. So, studies of context, there's one other, these are the important ones, and I've just listed this, the, the most common features. And as you can see, um, the, the actual different size of organization, how they own the problem, and you heard yesterday how leadership is so important. Leadership is crucial in context, and how you have your infrastructure and whether you're involved in QI. Uh, so, in summaries, context requires a, uh, or improvement requires the organizational culture and policies and environmental. So, here are two examples. This is where I'm working in Mozambique. So, the Mozambique is a poor country, saying this is on poorer than India, and so they have virtually nothing. And this is Jose Macau, and they told, told me Nelson on the left, who's the head of the physician, he said to me their problem is they have five patients dying every week in emergency who admit it from the ED. Five patients dying on the ward every week. So what we said, we want to identify, so I took a system from, the United, from Australia, this is between the flags, that Cliff Hughes, my colleague who's here today, he, they, their group invented, this is a tracking system, and it's based on life saving, and so they took that system, and we took it into the context of Mozambique, translated into Portuguese, but we'd used a different way of implementation, because on that, hospital ward, there were 76 beds and two nurses. I heard yesterday about having bed sitters. Well, there the families are there, are the ones who are observing, so it was helping them to identify patients. In their context, we changed the way, very different from what they did in Australia. Another one is the safe situation awareness for everyone in the UK. This is a project I'm running across 28 hospitals, and we take it, took something from the USA, from Cincinnati Children's, and we adapted it based in context on, on, uh, on uh, the, uh, oh, sorry, um, they're all gone. Based it on the um, model from Vincent on patient safety, and we're applying it now in the UK, we've done it in Sydney, we seem going to go to Ireland and Italy, and quite easy, this could come to India. It costs nothing, it's very easy to do to change context. So in final, the challenges we face is to understand how we measure in different contexts, how we study context, how we generalize, and how we describe what we do and scale up. And all of this is to facilitate equity of care, that any patient anywhere gets the same care. Edison said you need to look for novel ideas that others have used successfully. Uh, your idea has to be original only in the way you adapt it to your own problem and to your own context. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Peter. You know, context is so important, otherwise it's like shooting a moving target. <laughs> so if the plane takes off, it has to land somewhere. <laughs> and uh, it's so important to us. Our next speaker is, is Mark, and uh, you know, we will hear what he has to say next. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I just want to start by saying um, it's a great honor to be here. This is my 16th visit to, to India uh, over the last 10 years or so. It's a great honor to speak with Apollo. Um, as you can see, uh, I'm the global chairman for healthcare for KPMG. We operate in 156 countries. I'm also one of the 12 members of the World Economic Forum Health Council. And last year with Harvard University, we presented a piece of uh, research to Davos uh, which had taken us two years to complete, looking at the cost of misalignment between payor, 
provider, pharmaceutical company, and patients. Now, uh, the conclusion of that two-year study was if each country performed to its uh, upper quartile in the decile of sp expenditure, so we weren't comparing Sierra Leone with the United States, we could extend human life expectancy by four years for all seven billion citizens on the planet. So we know that misalignments in healthcare destroy value, uh, cost more money, and result in more patient harm. But those misalignments are not a reserve for payors, providers, pharmaceutical companies, and patients. Of course, they also happen inside organizations, as you well know. I've spent 30 years uh, leading hospitals, regions, a country, now globally, public sector, private sector, payor and provider. And about two years ago, we decided to uh, look at what was causing problems in uh, clinical safety and control inside hospitals in particular, uh, pursuing this theme that misalignment uh, causes greater cost and lower quality. It destroys value. As you can see, uh, I've uh, personally worked in 73 countries on about 275 occasions over the last eight years. And it's a great pleasure to be back in India today. And, and what we did, as I said, 18 months ago, is we talked to some of the leading organizations in patient safety. But also, if I can be frank with you, we talked to those that were aspiring to be uh, leading organizations. They weren't quite so good. Um, we did a lot of work looking at various clinical specialties and organizations, and then convened four global roundtables in uh, Boston, Lausanne, Amsterdam, and Sydney. Forgive me, it wasn't India. And you can see some of the organizations that we engaged with uh, on the slide before you. And what we found uh, as we were looking at uh, what people were doing were 10 characteristics that basically defined the context, if you like, following on from Peter's excellent presentation, the context in which clinical governance could improve, patient safety could improve. Now, I'm not going to go through all 10, but they're fairly axiomatic. They're fairly self-evident. So you look at number four, deep engagement with clinical staff. Number six, develop culture, hold professionals to account. Number seven, this issue of alignment again between individual team and organization. And then at number eight, um, publish and be damned. Never be afraid of transparency. It has caused revolutions in other parts of the world, in other industries, and this is something which we still sometimes try to hide away from our patients and indeed our public as well. But the four themes that emerge from this two-year research, these global roundtables and conferences, uh, basically were as follows. One, a culture devoted to quality. Two, very clear levels of responsibility and accountability. Three, optimizing and standardizing processes. So taking the best from improvement science and applying it on an industrial scale. And then fourthly, measurement. Now we have known, as Peter said, for about 20 years or so, that actually being in control requires great attention to detail. And the presentation, uh, the title of my presentation today is called The More I Know, The Less I Sleep. Because clinical quality in patient Safety is indeed a paradox. The more you know about it, the more anxious you become. And that's the way it should be. We should always be slightly anxious and always very keen to improve. And as you can see here from this uh, fairly detailed chart, uh, the number of patient handoffs in a process always causes more problems. It always usually causes more cost and quite often causes more complications as well. But the cries from the medical directors, the clinical directors, the nursing directors, and the chief executives from our global round tables was the desire, perhaps the uh, misplaced desire, to be in control. And of course, this concept of being in control has driven forward the concepts of high reliability organizations. 
And our stakeholders, when they were engaged, defined being in control as methodically measuring care outcomes, understanding the causes and drivers of these outcomes, making sure these outcomes were best in class, being anxious and restless to always improve, and dare I say it, curious as well, and of course, making sure that we reduce patient harm as far as possible. And when we do work with organizations around the world, we apply our own methodology to assess the preconditions, the cultural preconditions, the process preconditions, the people preconditions, the performance preconditions of looking at organizations in this way. Now, there are too many people in the audience today for me to play this game, but you can see here on this slide, we define organizations or we group organizations. And by the way, when I say organizations, this can mean clinical specialties, it can be in operating theaters, it can mean wards. It means the unit of activity that's most important and matters to you. But these four criteria, as you can see here, range from phase zero, which frankly is the wild west of healthcare, where everyone does their own thing. Doctor is God, and basically it's everyone else's job to understand what's going on in his or her mind. All the way through to level four, teams with strong situational awareness. Now you can see on this graphic here, as you move from phase zero, which is healthcare as a craft, some may say healthcare as a witchcraft, all the way through to high reliability care, you can see the definitions we apply. Honestly speaking, when we uh, are engaged often that to go into organizations that are not functioning properly, that are actually thinking about their cost base being out of control, we use this analysis because quite often boards are simply uh, deluded. They believe they have a higher degree of control in their organizations than they actually have. And most organizations that we work with are somewhere between phase zero and phase one. And I would challenge you all in this uh, audience uh, to really be honest with yourselves and think about which phase your clinical unit is in. Now, these four um, uh, objectives, of course, are self-reinforcing. They need, obviously, a good culture. But what we have found, as you start to think about what this means, is that, as you can see here from the medical director of uh, Helios in uh, Germany, the largest hospital chain in Germany, with over 100 hospitals, you can see here that he says, much of this isn't very sexy. It's the small stuff that matters the most, and it's sometimes hard to get everyone to focus on that. But these misalignments, as I've said, are the real cause for problems in quality and value. And of course, um, one, I'd like to read this quote, so please bear with me. It's a quote that I still find anywhere I work in any organization in any part of the world. And it's a fairly old quote from Mintzberg, coming up to 20 years old. It's about the concrete floor. Beneath it, the clinicians work away delivering their services, driven primarily by professional specializations, which are in turn driven by sophisticated technologies. Above it, senior managers advocate and negotiate with one another and manage the non-clinical operations when they are not, of course, engaging one of their perpetual and often fruitless reorganizations. Now, of course, breaking this down requires much greater clinical responsibility and accountability. And we know that this is very difficult. Having um, objectives at an individual team and organizational level, and now in the middle, uh, or sorry, just beginning to write my second book on the workforce crisis, and every conference I speak at, and I speak at a, a lot of conferences, I ask the audience what percentage of their staff in their organization have meaningful objectives with consequences. And you may be surprised to learn that less than 20% of people put their hands up. It's not possible to create a social movement. It's not possible to create continuous improvement if less than 20% of your staff have clear alignment between their objectives, their clinical team's objectives, and their organization's objectives. This alignment is fundamental for organizations becoming high, highly reliable. And therefore, you see, that takes you on to, do you have 
what in other industries are called SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures. And of course, most organizations don't have that. The successful organizations have that as a starting block. You can see, of course, there are many examples. Here's just one that's pretty well known of Intermountain. But also what we've done recently with colleagues from America and also my own uh, old university hospital, the University Hospital Birmingham, we've developed a global database that looks at quality and safety, productivity and financial performance. Now this graph uh, that you can see before you is probably too small for you to digest, but we now can by every organization in health system uh, across I think uh, 12 countries, we can look at how they perform across those three metrics, quality and safety, productivity and efficiency, and financial performance. And you can see from the slide in front of you that the variation is indeed quite great. It's the beginning of a conversation which allows you to start to think about these four building blocks in a different way. And finally, uh, yesterday I had the, um, the privilege of talking a little bit more about uh, my book that sold 20,000 copies now in 33 countries, being translated in Mandarin and also Korean and currently being translated into Portuguese and Spanish. But this book, uh, the title of which is In Search of the Perfect Health System, spends one of its chapters looking at the highest performing organizations. And quite simply put, if change is a human contact sport, you need to contact human beings. And this issue of alignment between individual clinical specialty or team and organization is not that difficult to achieve, but still seems to be elusive for most of the health industry around the world. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. I think uh, in a healthcare system, there's no question about reliability, and thank you for highlighting that. Um, your book uh, is something I would recommend that everybody picks up and reads. It gives us so much of uh, input. Our next speaker, we're really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. I think I'm the shortest at the podium so far. So, um, Good morning. It's a pleasure to join you and to uh, share with you some thoughts. Um, our entire discussion this morning is about learning together. And I want to spend the opportunity that I have been given to actually challenge um, what should together actually mean and how do, in fact, we work together and learn in greater partnerships. Um, let me start with what we all know. It's already been referenced or what have you. But what we already know is that healthcare as an industry is fundamentally challenged and some would say broken. We have a cost problem, we have a quality problem, we have an access problem all across healthcare. And again, this, this challenge, we talk about it all the time, the number of individuals that we harm, um, the delays that we put in place. The research around access is really interesting these days because what we're starting to realize is that the economic and social impact of delaying care is much larger than we have imagined. And again, we have a, a cost crisis where we cannot afford the healthcare system that we have. When I was getting ready to, to come to Mumbai and actually talk about this, um, I went about an exercise. I tend to be a data pack rat, and I keep all the presentations I've ever given on my laptop. And so my hard drive just gets bigger and bigger. And so I went back to 2002 and pulled the oldest presentation that I had on my files. Um, everything else is on glass slides, if you remember when you used to show slides. So this is the earliest digital presentation I have. And interestingly enough, what we were talking about um, back in 2002, this isn't working. There we go. 2002, exactly the same thing. I was giving in some ways the same speech back in 2002 that I'm doing today. That we have a cost problem, a quality problem, and an access problem. And it's not surprising because we all know what the definition of insanity is, correct? And that is doing the same thing expecting what? A different result. Well, in all reality, we have been doing the same thing in healthcare with a few changes on the periphery for about 100 and some years. 
modern healthcare was actually designed based on the innovations of antisepsis and anesthetic. That is when we moved healthcare into hospitals. It's when we, in fact, began surgical interventions. Healthcare was about humors prior to that time, blood, bile, black bile, phlegm. And then we started to, in fact, believe that we could fix bodies. We could actually fix patients. My wonderful wife had a car accident not too long ago. She was fine. It wasn't a major accident. But she described what was going to happen, and they called emergency services to help the, to check her out, to check the car out, and what have you. And it brought to reality that healthcare today is still pretty much designed like a garage shop. We wait for something to happen. We bring the patient in. We lift them up on what we call a bed rather than a lift. We fix them, we drive them around a little bit, and we send them home. That is the way healthcare, fundamentally, that's our DNA. That is how it is designed, is that we have these garage shops. So we've been doing much the same thing. And now, again, we tweak it on the edges. We change some things. But fundamentally... You could go back in time to a hospital of the 1950s, and all of you would be able to find your way around that hospital. It looks very much the same. And so if insanity is doing pretty much the same thing, expecting a different result, and if we want a fundamentally different result, I would argue that we have to change fundamentally how we are structured. And so at Advisory Board, we started looking several months ago at is there an example of an industry that has changed itself, that has been able to solve the triple crisis of cost, quality, and access. And although we often talk about the airline industry from a safety perspective, we often do not think about it from an industry-wide perspective. And if you look at the data, the airline industry has achieved what healthcare has not. Costs continue to decrease. Year after year, we spend less on transportation than we did before. Quality is near perfect, and in fact, access is increasing. 50% more people flying today than actually flew just seven, eight years ago. And so if you think about it, was this always the case? It was not. Because quite frankly, airline travel used to be highly unsafe. There were some technology changes back in the 1960s and 70s, which improved this somewhat. But then there was a long period of static non-change. And then, all of a sudden, the industry decided. Now, it wasn't sort of an act of, of you know, uh, global thinking. Uh, it changed uh, at its core, however, that the airline industry was going to reorganize itself. And there were some fundamental changes that happened about 25 years ago that f- changed how the airline industry works. Several things were happening. They redesigned the cockpit. They redesigned processes. But there was also a fascinating meeting between the leaders of Northwest Airlines and KLM. It happened, I believe, in a restaurant. And they decided that they could not solve the industry's problems alone. And they decided that what they had to do is form complex partnerships. Today, we know how that works. Let me use myself as an example. I live literally in the middle of nowhere in the United States. I live in one of the most sparsely populated parts of of the U.S. in South Dakota. We have more animals than we do people. And flying to Mumbai is not technically the most frequented route. So how did I get here? Ultimately, um, I flew a couple different flights, but I booked my flight ultimately on an online retailer called Kayak, a company called Menzies Loads My Bag in my home airport. I fly an airline you've never heard of called Endeavor, whose logo is on no airplanes, to Minneapolis. I fly Delta to Amsterdam. I fly KLM ultimately to Mumbai. Um, or Jet Airways to Mumbai, either one. And then finally, Universal Aviation unloads my bag. You all know this is how it works. I could talk about this slide, however, for a very long time. What's interesting is that if you look at this system, it is not designed for the convenience of the providers. It is designed, this pathway is designed for the passenger. It actually works to great inconvenience for the providers. It is designed for the passenger. The other thing is competitors 
outright competitors, people that don't like each other very well, are working together in order to get the job done. And in many cases, there's no contract or control in place. But every partner does what it needs to do in service to a much larger pathway that serves the customer. That's what working and learning together actually looks like. What it has allowed the industry, the airline industry, to do is to achieve what we need to do. And that is, first of all, creating scope. That is breadth of service. The airline industry can take almost anyone, anywhere to anywhere else on the planet. We need to be able to treat any patient with any disease regardless of where they live. But we have to do it at scale. We have to have the volumes in order to get the job done correctly. And so what the airline industry has recognized is that the only way they could do this, lower cost, increase quality, expand access, was to rely on one another and to partner in order to design the system. And we would argue that that's what we need to be able to do. It takes a fundamental shift in our thinking, giving up control, giving up silo mentality, not trying to do it all, always sitting down and doing whatever the patient specifically needs. It's starting to work. Let me actually just share with you very rapidly some fast examples. I can certainly get you more details on each one of these. But let me give you some crazy examples of this working. Partnerships unlike we've ever seen before. Um, ultimately, Washington Medical Center, um, I'm going to skip this one, Washington Medical Center in the United States, um, they had to identify high-risk patients, and so their number one screening mechanism now is the barber shop, where they've trained barbers to screen patients for heart disease. Why? Because the patients weren't coming to doctors, and so the hospital partnered with the community in order to find these patients. If you go to the Isle of Jersey, right off the coast of France, in order to provide daily checkups on at-home patients, the health service is partnering with the postal service. And it is now mail carriers who knock on the door every day, ask questions, bring drugs, make sure that the patient gets to their appointment and alerts the hospital and the health system of any patients who happen to be in trouble. Great example from Rotterdam in the Netherlands where they wanted to be experts in safety, and they realized they didn't actually have the expertise, so they partnered with KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. Teach us how to provide safe care. And so now at Rotterdam Eye Hospital, you all know that if an airplane, and it doesn't happen very often, crashes, there's a black box that we go to to look at. Every surgery at Rotterdam Eye Hospital is video recorded, so we know what's going on. Um, every doctor, every nurse goes through training, which actually includes flight, flight simulation, on how to communicate. They imported all of that expertise. They were not so arrogant to think they knew how to do all of it. Walgreens Corporation, drugstore that also owns Boots in the UK and elsewhere in the world, has partnered with Allegis to create a frequent user program. You've all uh, perhaps seen these if you go and more stuff at the, at the store, you earn points, you get free merchandise. Walgreens now will give you free merchandise if you do your 10,000 steps every day. And so now all of a sudden, my wife is telling me to walk so that she can buy more stuff. We're seeing partnerships around service lines, partnerships across time zones. Macquarie University and um, Emory Healthcare, um, actually Emory has moved their doctors to Australia so that they are awake and alert when in fact the ICUs need advice and counsel. We've got partnering for infrastructure in the middle part of the UK where seven trusts who compete for patients are implementing one technology uh, for radiology. Not every hospital buying its own equipment but sharing its equipment across all. Walgreens Corporation in the United States is partnering for service lines where when one of their employees, Walgreens, by the way, is the largest private employer on the planet because they're based in the United States. They provide health care for millions of people. 
and yet they don't believe that their, their employees, just because they happen to live in Bentonville, Arkansas, should be destined to get their care in Bentonville, Arkansas. And so, for example, heart care, if you have a high-end heart condition, Walgreens will fly you to one of six centers of excellence for heart care. And if you have cancer, you go to other hospitals. They take you to the best-performing hospital. Walgreens, by the way, reduced their cost 40%. How'd they do it? Most 40% of procedures weren't actually needed. That once the patient was sent to the center of excellence, there was a different pathway of care. Boston Children's has partnered with Amazon and what's called the Amazon Echo, which is like Siri on your phone. It's artificial intelligence. Now a, a family can get up in the middle of the night with a sick child, and they call out to their Echo device. It's called an Echo Dot, and they ask it a question. My child is sick. What do I do? And it takes it through a free algorithm that is provided to Amazon, um, taking the patient through a diagnostic protocol for their child and eventually making an appointment if necessary. Um, I can give you more examples, but it argues that in the future, we do have to put the patient in the center, which means all of us as providers have to step back and all of us have to be willing to be part of a bigger picture where the care process is designed for the patient's convenience and then all we do is our small, our small part of that reality. It's a very different world when we don't control it, but we think it's the only way to improve cost, quality, and access. Thank you so much. Mike, thank you for that most fascinating presentation. You know, you started off with your early slide, which spoke about quality, cost, access, and the crisis of it. And then you brought us to the present and to the future about how we can literally work together to achieve all the challenges which we face. Thank you. That was pretty amazing and a huge learning for all of us who work with healthcare systems. Our, our next speaker, Agarwalji, uh, is somebody who is, you know, the whole country is fascinated with. <laughs> Thank you so much for accepting to speak to us and I Thank turn so the much. stage Thank to you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, you all. I know I'm not going to speak in a technical, neither technology, but I will going to speak and show techniques. That's it. I know Dr. Peter, Mr. Mark, Mr. Michael has shown you a lot many technical things, how you can be best in your health. And Dr. Pita is chairperson. Thanks, Dr. Anupam, for inviting me. Friends, you know, so you told that I'm going to speak on Dabawalas. Time is very short, 20 minutes, but fortunate they are given 10 minutes, I given 20 minutes. Before somebody gets sleep to me, I will finish before that, not to be worried. <laughs> because time is important, and I'm going to speak one time is time management also. Friends, before wasting time, let me speak, because I know these people may not be knowing about Dabawalas, but sir, Daba means lunchbox. And the wala means man who carried tiffin. So we are delivery boys in Mumbai who deliver lunchbox. But the food is cooked at your home. They are not catering food. The food is cooked at your home. What the are doing? They are collecting in the morning your home cooked food from your lunchbox. They will collect in the morning and they will deliver before lunch time in your office. After lunch is over, they will back empty tiffin same day in the evening at home. They are doing simple two deliveries. On these two deliveries, I will speak 20 minutes. Just imagine this. <laughs> because their delivery is important. But more than that, how you deliver, that is more important, more important friend. In the same way, you also, yes, you are the doctors or medical people who are working for patients. You are working excellent, but how you work is also important friends. As far as Dabawalas are concerned, many people believe, they don't know why you require Dabawala to collect your tiffin. Why you cannot carry your tiffin. Sir, in Mumbai, our customer travel by local train. You know local train. And we are having 60, 70 kilometer route. So it takes three hours from home to workplace. Suppose you want to reach office 9 o'clock, you should start morning 6 o'clock from your home. And still you want to carry your own lunch box. Your wife should cook 5 o'clock. Mumbai husband do not allow wife to cook 5 o'clock. 
Why? Mumbai husband love his wife. <laughs> he want my wife should cook eight o'clock. No problem. Wife cook. Sorry, husband start six o'clock. Wife cook eight o'clock and nine o'clock. Who come to collect tiffin? Dawa wala. Sir, we give service to customer and we make customer's wife happy. That's a business. <laughs> Friend, what is my message? If you give service to customer, your customer should satisfy. But along with customer, other people also should satisfy. That's a service you should give to any customer. Friends, we believe Mumbai Dabawalas are called masters of logistics supply chain. We call as a master because we believe whatever you do, you should be master. You should be master. Of course, I know why I'm sharing this story with you. Because Dabawalas are poor people. They are illiterate people. They are working in adverse situation. Despite all this fact, their work is recognized all over the globe. Sir, they are ordinary people working extraordinarily. Imagine we are extraordinary. We can work how much? We can work best. Somebody asked me, Dr. Bowen, we want to invite you, but what are the takeaways from your session? I told I will give away whatever you want, you take away. I don't know the takeaways. No, no, you have to give some takeaways. I asked somebody, he told these are the takeaways. Okay, I give him these takeaways. <laughs> yes, I know. From my session, you will find passion, commitment, consistency. Sir, these people working in Mumbai last 127 years in Mumbai. 127 years consistently. Can you imagine, friends? And that too with 100% execution. 100%. Sir, in 127 years, it never happened. Single tiffin is not delivered. Impossible. 100% delivery. 100%. I asked Dabawala, if one tiffin is not delivered, what will happen? What Dabawala says, if one tiffin is not delivered, that day my customer can eat outside food. But suppose that day my customer's wife put medicine for husband. And if that day I have not delivered tiffin, and if customer could not get medicine and something happened wrong to customer. Dabawala says, I am responsible. And that's the reason every delivery is important. Every delivery is important. <laughs> Friend, we never bother about mistakes. We bother about consequences. That's why they says. Despite illiterate, they deliver accurately because of dedication, timely. So despite Mumbai Dabawala delivery, it's total dependent on local train. Local train may not run on time, but Dabawala always on time. Can you imagine this? <laughs> Why? He says, I am not railway minister. I cannot change train system. I can change my system. That's it. <laughs> so this is possible because of complete customer satisfaction. Everybody in this world is working for customer, customer, customer. And the ball is working with these two principles. Number one, work is worship. Sir, you believe my work is more important than my family. I'm sorry, friends. Because Banda bolta hai, sir, parivar hai to kaam karta hoon. Kaam karta hai to parivar nahi, yaar. Because of that, my work is important. It's a fact, friend. Even for doctor. I'm sorry, friend. Your family is important, no doubt. But more than that, patient life is more important. Because he is fully dependent on you. He comes to us. And because of that, Dabala says, customer is God. Lots of hard work they do. Friends, see the history of Dabawala. Started in 1890. Ma'am, in 1890, there was one Dabawala, one customer. Today we'll see 5,000 Dabawala delivering every day 200,000 lunch box. 200,000 lunch box. Can you imagine this? Friends, and this time takes 9 hours to deliver. They work 8, 9, 10 hours. And believe me, in 9 hours, he do not relax 1 minute for anything, not at all. Despite he worked nine hours passionately. In that also morning, three hours of war time. Why? Customers should deliver in time. He says, even my customer is the manager of company. If I deliver late, can my customer company will change lunch time? He says, no. And because of that, if I am going late, my customer will eat outside food. His home to free will waste. He will pay money and he will waste time. He know the late consequences and because of that he always in time and this is possible because of the structure the people do not know the meaning of structure some Dabawala when they speak they says this is our organization stature I told Dabawala this is not stature this is structure <laughs> what he replied sir stature and structure is same how if stature is strong patient goes to bed if structure is strong tiffin goes to customer that's it <laughs>
friend, I am having a lot to speak, but time constraint is there. Let me tell how they are giving. Friend, this is local train map. You must be knowing in Mumbai, we have three trains. Metro train, mono train, local train. But Dabala allow travel only by local train because they allow travel by luggage compartment. And only local train having luggage compartment. I will show with animation how this Dabala is throughout the day working. I will show you with animation very quickly. He will collect 40 tiffin and he will drop that 40 tiffin to the nearest station called Ville Parle. Why? Tiffins are resorted at Ville Parle. At Ville Parle, again he will carry 40 tiffin from Ville to Dadar, 1570 kilometer. Again, he will get down at Dadar because Tiffins again resorted. He will carry 40 lunch box from Dadar to Grand Road because Tiffins are resorted. It means whole day he is in collection, delivery, sorting, resorting, loading, unloading, coding, decoding. All work he is doing. Nine hours completely busy. Friend, now from Grand Road, he will carry 40 to Church Gate. Last destination. Now he will carry 40 by road. He will carry 40 on head, on shoulder, on by carts, carts, maybe on bicycle, he will carry 40 from church gate to Nariman point. Last job, he will deliver 40 tiffin to this express tower building because in this building, 40 customers waiting for lunch box. All 40 customers will deliver before lunch box, before lunch time. When customer will eat food, this man will eat his own food, which he carries since morning. He cannot outside, it is costly. Friend, when customer will eat food, this man will eat his own food for 20 minutes. He gets for lunch only 20 minutes. He will finish in 20 minutes. He will come back. Now he will carry. He will come to collect empty tiffin boxes. He will start to collect empty tiffin in the same manner from expert urban point. Then, 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 then when he comes in the evening 5 o'clock, he will receive his morning 40. Now empty tiffin, which he will deliver your homes. 6 o'clock, he got free. Morning 8 o'clock till 6 o'clock, he do not relax 5 minutes. Despite evening 6 o'clock, you will see happiest moment on his face. For what purpose? Today's job I had done successfully. I'm happy. I'm happy. <laughs> Banda Bolta, it is my job. I should do air. I'm the happiest person got this job. He says, God has chosen me because I deserve to do that. I only can do my job. I should do the best because I'm the master. That is what the feeling when he works. Friend, everybody should work with the same passion. I know, thanks almighty God, I have a couple of doctors in my family. But when newcomers want to do doctor, they say, no, 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 doctor life is not good. Man, is one of the best life. You're working for people, saving life of others. Man, hats up to you. Hats up to Apollo. I know very well how they are extraordinarily working for all ordinary Indians. That's why they are great. They are great friends. Friends, it's no, you know that. How these Dabawalas are working. See the working of Dabawala. Sir, they are having one error in 16 million transactions. You can imagine this. And because of that, Dabala got Six Sigma certification. The people do not know the meaning of Six Sigma. They got Six Sigma. <laughs> because they are not working for Six Sigma. They are working for customer satisfaction. That too without technology. That too with less charges. Per month, 600. Sir, per day it comes 21, 22 rupees. Even courier person charge 35 rupees. He charge 21 because you know my customers are traveling in local train. He knows my customer cannot be outside. I should charge less. That's why despite he earn 15,000, average maybe 12,000. He earn extra. How early morning they deliver mail bags. They deliver newspaper ma'am. Evening they will drive auto rickshaw taxi. I earn 5, 10,000 more. I asked, 20,000 sufficient? He said, I'm not qualified. 20 is more than sufficient. In Mumbai, there are qualified people may not earn 10, 15,000. I am earning 20,000. I'm the happiest person. You can imagine, friends. Money everybody want. Dabawala also want Diwali bonus. Sir, some customer do not pay bonus. I told Dabawala, this customer not paid bonus. Why want to continue? What he replied, my customer is God. How I can stop to eat food to my God? I told my God, your God, I don't pay bonus. What he replied, he has not paid one month bonus, but he has paid 12 months salary. For one month bonus, if I discontinue, I will lose 12 months. What did to sacrifice? One month or 12 months? He says, one month, no problem. And because of that, in 127 years, no strike record. Never went on strike. Proved work is worship. Customer is God. What is my message, friend? Work satisfaction. If you are satisfied with work, then and only then customer will be satisfied. Because I have done PhD on Dabawala, let me tell you some examples of customer satisfaction. I asked one customer, can you tell me how Dabawala works? 
Customer told they are excellent. I asked, what excellent man? Tiffin is your, food is your, Dabala simply deliver, that's it. Customer told, they are not simply delivering food. Listen what customer told. Customer told, when I leave 6 o'clock, sometimes customer forget his mobile spectacle at home. Then 9 o'clock, customer's wife put husband mobile in lunchbox. And Dabala deliver. You know what is mean. It means along with lunch, Dabala deliver mobile also. It means Dabala give value added services to customers. <laughs> I asked another customer, can you tell me what Dabala do? Customer told, they are honest. I asked, how they can be dishonest? They cannot eat your food? Listen what customer told. No sir, not food. Then listen customer told. Sir, when I get salary, customer cannot carry salary in pocket. Why it can be stolen in crowded local train? What customer do? When you get salary? Yes, sir. After eating food, customer put salary in empty tiffin. Double or deliver empty tiffin with salary in the hands of customer's wife. Honesty, honesty. Because in 127 years, Dabala never opened tiffin. Never opened tiffin. I'm sorry, we qualified people working under CCTV. What nonsense. Is it good, friends? Friend, I am the best. I don't require that device should control because I am the big device. I don't want to control somebody else. I want to do myself best. And because of that deliver, friend, not money. Some customer deliver gold, silver. You know, some customer wife send love letter. I don't know what they send. <laughs> but own wife, not somebody else's wife. <laughs> because some people must be saw that lunchbox movie. wife, but let me tell the real story I'll tell you. I asked one Dabawala customer, can you tell me how they deliver? They told, my God, excellent. What happened? My change, life was changed. Because of Dabawala, customer life changed. Why? Because he was sharing with me. Couple of months before, that customer had dispute with his wife. And you know how Indian husband wife fight. I'm sorry, friends. <laughs> sorry, husband. You know the quality of Indian husband. Our Indian husband will not fall in front of the baby's face. Impossible. <laughs> Same thing happened. That husband fighted with his wife. Angry young man. Next day morning told his wife divorce. He went to office. Nine o'clock, Dabawala came home. Indian wife, Dile ke manta nahi. Despite dispute, she delivered Tiffin to lunchbox Dabawala. And Dabawala delivered in office. In lunch time, husband saw the Tiffin. Morning angry young man become the hungry young man. So you open the tiffin. When you open the tiffin, on top of tiffin, return message from wife. Oh, my beloved husband, I love you, Lord. Forget drop in the morning. Eat my food. It is for you. The message given by wife to husband delivered by. Agni story sunna. Khana khane ke baad husband ko sharam to aati hai. After eating food, husband brought two cinema tickets, put in empty tiffin, return love letter to wife. And husband wife came together because of Dabawala. Sir, it required attitude approach. It required discipline. Sir, let me tell video how they are sharing. Sir, how was dena? 65, 70 kg. They are traveling, carrying that to some people 65 years of age, 75 years of age. Collecting tiffin boxes filled with homemade food from different houses and distributing them at the workplaces of the earning members of this these families. This man is 83 years old, noon. still working. And, and this is possible because of their very good coding. Let me tell very quickly what is coding. Sir, VLP stands for Ville Parle. Recollect my local train map. E stands for Dabawala. Mr. E will go to Ville Parle and this lunchbox will carry from Ville Parle to number 3 called Nariman Point. It means E man will collect this tiffin. This tiffin will collect from Ville Parle and deliver at Nariman Point. When it will reach Nariman point, who will pick this tiffin? Mr. Nain Dabawala. He will collect, he will deliver EX for express tower and 12 stand for 12th floor because this customer office is on 12th floor. Without name address, your tiffin you received at your office. I know some people looking disosa, disosa is a customer. And who I written this name? Mr. Customer Disoza himself writing because Mr. Customer Disoza could not recognize his own tiffin, he writes name. <laughs> what is my message? Customer may not be knowing, but the baller know. Same way, patient may not be knowing, doctor should know what is the patient requirements. That's what we should feel. Friends, see what they are doing. Every day, with practically no mix-ups at all. 
Simple Life matches, they become the brush. Simple piece of paper become the brush. They are doing this to this. This lunchbox, which contains Friend, the meals, what he has what cooked for this husband, man is doing. has been coded VLP 23 MT10 on the top, and Q3 is scribbled below. Let me tell you for responsibility. You know what this man is doing? Sir, this man is doing recoding. Why? When you clean Tiffin at home, sometimes our coding is not visible properly. If any Dabala comes to know coding is not proper, he will remove color from pocket and with finger he will overwrite. He will not say it is not my job. He will do the job. Why? Karna hai to karna hai. No excuse nahi. Friends, see. That 200,000 of them are having it on all working days on time. Thanks to the Mumbai Dabawa. Watch the spontaneous sorting. Everyone is picking up his tiffins as per his delivery areas. Tiffins for areas with more density are transported on cut. One tiffin box shifts hands in transit at least six. Friend, they wonder because of excellent work documented made by UTV, MTV, A to Z TV. They got many achievements. Dabala got Six Sigma Guinness World Record. Dabala got ISO certificate without application. <laughs> I done PhD on this. Sir, Mr. Richard, Richard Banson came to Mumbai in 2003. Before Richard Banson was supposed to come, six months prior, British consulate phoned Dabawala. Dabawala, Prince Charles want to meet you. Prince Charles, sorry. Prince Charles want to come to meet Dabawala. And consulate phoned Dabawala. Prince Charles want to meet you. Dabawala replied, I don't know his Prince Charles. <laughs> consulate told man, he is a king of London. Dabawala replied, oh, king of London. Okay, we will allow him. Let him come. No problem. <laughs> but with two conditions. Number one, we will give only 20 minutes to Prince Charles because Dabawalas are busy. They cannot give more time to Prince Charles. <laughs> Number two, we will not go to Prince Charles. Prince Charles should come to us. Where? Church get footpath. <laughs> Consulate told, man, you, sp you speak like this. What Dabawala told? Sir, he is a king of London, but 200,000 customers are the true king. We cannot disturb our customers for one king. That's the reason these are the two requests. <laughs> Sir, when Prince Charles came to know, Dabala spoke like this. He told, oh, I will come. He came. And believe me, friend, because Prince Charles came to visit Dabala, from that day, Dabala globally recognized because of Prince Charles. And from that day, Dabala started to believe Prince Charles also God for them. He feel God for them. Can you imagine? Even, friend, you must be knowing, in Prince Charles' marriage, sir, three Indians invited to attend Prince Charles' marriage. Among three Indians, two Dabawala. No Prime Minister, no President invited. But Dabawala invited. They purchased gift. They sent gift. Dabawala got invitation. They want to attend Prince Charles' marriage. But when they're supposed to start for marriage, Dabawala phoned me. Sir, bad news. What happened? Sir, this is second marriage of Prince Charles, which is not good. <laughs> At per Indian culture, second marriage is not good, sir. <laughs> I told Dabawala, you are invited for the first time. For Dabawala, this is first marriage. Oh, first marriage. Now we will go. Then they went. <laughs> sir, what is my message? My message is this. Because Prince Charles came, Dabawala recognized. We message, if somebody help in your life, you should not forget that help. You should have high regards for that help. We have same regards for Prince Charles because he is God for Dabawalas. Sir, even Richard Manson came to Mumbai. He won photo with Dabawala. Because of photo, he brought his own lunchbox with Virgin logo. I remember, I gave my cap to Mr. Branson. I said, the boss story, dosto. Samay nahi hai. But it's my privilege to tell you, even we are working with social commitment, HIV AIDS, maybe Swachha Bharat Abhiyan. Even we are apparent ambassador for Swachha Bharat Abhiyan. We work for yoga. Even we work for friends. What do you call? Roti Bang. And this is possible because of 20 qualities. It's my privilege. I am giving Mumbai Dabala Education Center. Last 14 years, I am providing free education to Dabala children because I am educationist. I should do this. In 2010, I started Dabala Education Center. I told Dabala, you should learn computer. Dabala told, no, we will not learn computer because we are not interested. I told, man, tomorrow youth will give you on internet to learn computer. No, no, we will not learn. Whole year I was trying. At the end of the year, I got idea. In my school, I made a wooden local train. In every coach, I put PC, invited Dabala. Dabala told, local train, now we will come to learn <laughs> computer. You want to teach English because tomorrow, Dr. Peter, you will come to Mumbai. You do not know Hindi and Marathi. I told Dabawala, he should know English. Good morning, tomorrow I will not come. At least you should know. To teach English, we made wooden classrooms of Dabawala. And they sit inside, they learn English. 
It's our privilege. They do like this. It's my privilege. Thank you so much for listening me so patiently. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think you should give him a standing ovation. So much, thank you so much. Can you give that back, sir, to me? I'm sorry, sorry, sir. I ask you to, friends, sir. I know extended time, but still 30 seconds are remaining with me. <laughs> and I want to honor this speaker with this our cap, sir. It will look beautiful on your. <laughs> <laughs> See now, Dr. Peter will look more handsome, <laughs> sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Friend, let me tell you, in the ball as on today, 19 females are there. So Dr. Preeta also have right to take this cap. Thank you, sir. Oh, sir, great, great, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so nice of you, sir. Thank you. Sir, so it's our privilege. It's called honor. Thank you so much, friend. Thank, Thank you. you. Preeta, ma'am, you will also look more beautiful in this. Sir, I got one more gift for you all. Friends, uh, I, because I know this is a Dabawala, so I brought small lunchbox for them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anupama. I don't know where he is there. Achha, you are. Sir, please come. He is the man who invited me to come to this dais. Sir, you have right to take this honor. Thank you, Anubam sir. Thank you so much. You. Sorry, sir. One minute. Dono book dena. Sir, I have two books written on Dabawala and same book I have given to Prince Charles in Buckingham Palace. Sir, these two books I am handing over to your association, Apollo Hospital. My book written on Dabawala. Thank you so much, friend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pita, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, thank you, honorable speakers. Yes, sir, yes, sir. He is a chartered accountant. He is working for me for the same profession. No, he's like, okay, let's take this cap. Oh my gosh, I'm just so overwhelmed. Um, I don't even know what to say. Agarwal ji, thank you. You know, if you said customer is uh, God, sometimes I think for all of us, we have to just worship that spirit, passion, or focus. And it's, it's amazing what uh, the Dabawalas have done. Um, I wish we could clone you and take you to the, you know, if, if there was a chance to make the Dabawalas run our country, just for a short while, with no <laughs> politics at all, <laughs> India would be an even better country to live in. <laughs> but today's session has been uh, just phenomenal, and I'm so glad we are taping it, and with the permission of everyone on stage, I think this is something that every em Apollo employee, every employee in the healthcare sector should have the opportunity to look at. You know, we spoke about uh, context, we spoke about reliability, we spoke about how organizations are coming together to deliver to the customer. And then we heard about how customer is king and the passion of serving the customer is really what everything is all about. Uh, we could not have asked for anything better, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. Thank you all again so much, you know, our speakers. I, sometimes I don't even know how to say thank you to all four of you. So I'm, I'm totally overwhelmed. 
But having said that, we stuck to time so well that we actually have time for some questions, uh, which you know we'd like all of you to answer. So could I go to you know the far right? Uh, one question from each bay would be superb. So anyone with any questions on the far right? And it's, it has to be only a question okay. and, uh, so that we can answer and address it to whoever's on the dais. That's Dr. Wagner, yeah. Uh, Mr. I uh, just wanted a question to say, so is patient- Can we have all the hall lights on, please? Yeah. So is patient-centered care the new mantra or is it just something which you're, uh, is patient-centered care the new mantra or is it something which has been, which has always been there, it's just we are defining it, redefining it now? Who's the question Wagner. to? Mr. Wagner. Ms. Wagner. So, um, so I want to make sure I understood the question. Are you ask, you're asking if patient-centered care is the, is the key element here? Absolutely. And I think what, what, um, what we're seeing is that um, what we need to be, to truly be patient-centered, you need to actually map and understand the patient's pathway all the way from the beginning of their need to the conclusion of their need. And we actually need to be able to design care that addresses all of those issues. Let me give you one very short story. I was working with a mental health institution in Australia, and the number one barrier to patients being admitted into the hospital was that a sizable number of patients had no one to take care of their dogs and cats at home. And so in that case, that hospital had to realize that was a clinical inhibitor, so they had to partner with an animal care agency to provide service for the dogs and the cats. That was the only way the patient could actually get their care. And so yes, absolutely, truly patient-centered. What is the patient experiencing from start to finish? And we have to deliver service, not just in the hospital, but at every step of that patient journey. Phenomenal. I just want to comment on that. I think that if you look at the history of medicine or healthcare, patient-centered care has always been important, but over the, as we became more scientific and more medicalized, so patient-centered care became less in focus. So from the, say, from the mid-50s to now, it suddenly decreased, but suddenly with the power of patients knowing more and with, with internet and so on, patient-centered care is now at the forefront. So I think it's a return of what was at the core of healthcare originally. And as the complexity of healthcare has become, we often forgot about the patient and thought about the disease and designed our healthcare around diseases rather than around patients. So all the ologies, all the different ologies, rather than thinking at the person who has all these positions. So I think we're returning to the core of medicine and healthcare. And I just want to comment on the first speak on, on Dr. Takarau, is that, in terms of context, my message to India is that your solutions are in India. You don't really need to import all the people. You can just look at the great things that are happening in India. Thank you. Anyone from the center? Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. I think that gentleman there. Yeah, the rest I'm, of you can send slips or email. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of questions. Good morning and uh, thank you for the excellent talks. I'm a medical doctor and uh, traditionally in India especially, it's like doctors are God, we know everything that's best for the patient. And I'm glad that there is a rethinking on that, especially saying that patients know their needs. But there's always a balance because sometimes it, you need to hurt the patient to cure him. You know, so the question is who is the best to know the patient's real need? Is it? just the doctor or the nurse or the patient himself or the relatives and is there a structure or a way in which we can define that better for our understanding who do you want who's it i mean the entire team anyone can answer from you you also maybe <laughs> mike you want you want to take that um I, I think quite simply you should always start with the patient but everyone's got a stake in that patient's care so i don't think there has to be a one single person that absolutely owns the patient's experience or needs, but it has to start and end with the patient experience. And, and just while I've got the mic, I, I speak all over the world. That was one of the most inspirational speeches 
I've ever heard in my life. And if you can shift that much food around by hand using a coding structure that goes on the top of the tin, honestly, your country can conquer the world. Can we go to this, uh, towards the end of the hall? Any, any questions there? Okay, then I think this group had a question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for, uh, for such a inspiring speech. My question is, Dabbawala says customers are God. In, others, in our setup, the patients say doctor is the God. There is a shift which is causing a lot of turmoil in medical fraternity, and we are losing their status of being God. Should we continue? I think we should not, because we have limitations, and since we live in a litigant society with limitations, we must treat our patient in a transparent and truthful way. I would like to have your comments on this, please. Uh, before Agarwalji comments, I think, you know, since I work with hospitals and doctors, uh, you know, life, everything goes through a full circle, and it's very important for us to sometimes step back, look in the mirror, and relook at the kind of work which we are doing. And if we could go back and really learn from, you know, very simple agenda, very simple focus, wife or, you know, mom cooks the food, it has to reach the customer. And the daba has to go back, and they have built a whole philosophy behind it. Maybe we are here in the business of caring. We have to look after the patient. And maybe our whole philosophy and our systems have to change and we have to learn from them. So I think uh, where, who is the customer? Is the cust if the patient is the customer, even the God has to come down to the customer. And I think th that is what we need to learn. You know, if Prince Charles can go to a footpath, uh, why can't the God now, you know, go back to the customer? And it's, uh, it's, it's a learning. And uh, my father, who's a doctor, has taught everyone there. He says, go, you know, the patient is lying down. And he says, touch the patient's feet first. Because he is your God. And then ask him the questions and you do whatever you want to do. And, and if that philosophy can actually come in, to all the work which we're doing as hospital providers, so much will become much simpler. But, you know, this is my point of view. But, Agarwalji, the question was to you. So, go ahead. Yes, he spoke correct. But, sir, I was speaking on behalf of Dabawalas. So, Dabawala says customer is God. But let it tell you, friend, customer says Dabawalas are the Annadata. That is what important, sir. In the same way, you'll always save the life of customer so customer says patient says you are god but sir if patients are not there doctor will be nowhere so from doctor side rightly she told her father told to touch the feet of patient why because her customer is always god in every profession if customer is not there i think he will not be there that's why he says customer is god we always want to serve the customer that's what our strategy Thank you, Agarwalji. It reinforces our faith in, in, in humanity. So I'd like to thank the audience for uh, being such a wonderful audience. But to the speakers, again, it's not easy to get a galaxy of speakers who just span the entire spectrum of the kind of work which we do. So thank you all so much. This session will come to a close. But for those of you who, who still have questions, uh, email IDs are available. I'm sure you'll get an answer back. But stay inspired because you could never have gotten a more uh, inspired group of speakers talking to all of you. Please don't forget the learnings and don't think it's a great conference. We had a lot of fun. And go back to your work spots. Please take the learnings back because such moments are very hard to come by. Thank you all again and thank you for a great inspirational morning.
Thank you all. What an energizing session to begin the day. Coming up next is our, it's our session on innovation breakthrough, termed as ICU. To talk about the session, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Srikant Rawat, founder and CEO, Plan Vito Technologies, and Dr. Prasanna Ganapa, founder and CMO, Plan Vito Technologies. Sir, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it was a uh, very inspiring speech today morning from uh, Dabawala and, uh, of course, other speakers. So uh, my next talk is basically we are uh, innovators, uh, startup. So uh, I think it's much similar to what the, uh, Dabawala is doing, uh, same thing, similar thing we do in healthcare. So we are basically an information delivery system, sort of, where we want to uh, have a doctor sees patient through uh, delivery of information back and forth. So, if, uh, slide. Excuse me, can you have the slide? So basically our solution is uh, called ICU solution. It's a, a vendor neutral, it's a bit unique uh, because of the core platform. And uh, it's a remote monitoring solution called ICU. So uh, everyone knows uh, regarding the healthcare scenario, so there is huge demand supply gap. And uh, so uh, basically we need a cost effective technology to bridge this gap because human, it's impossible humanly to bridge this gap just using, uh, uh, without technology use. So again, key, uh, things to be considered is affordability, access, because we have to reach to the base of the pyramid, and of course, without compromising on quality. So what is this ICU concept? Basically, it's an IoT base. So this is where the fundamental structure or uniqueness come is because of the IoT base, solution for real-time, continuous, remote monitoring of vital health parameters of a critical patient in an ICU uh, to enable uh, tele-ICU care. So, uh, if I see uh, this, so uh, the core basically in an ICU is what we put IoT platform, which enables to do wonders. So what it does, we interface with all the devices, whatever is there, the systems, so that this data from the medical devices in real time is pushed to wherever it's needed. So within an ICU, we have a universal central station. So there. All the devices that is hooked to a patient, all the data is in one single place. And then coming next, so we enable mobility once we are outside the ICU. So the doctor, anywhere he is, anywhere in the world, he'll be able to access the same data real time from anywhere. Also looking at historical view of the trending and so forth. So all the data, customized alerts can be seen. And then coming to a one step ahead, so using a audio video kit, so also a sort of command center is created where the doctor can sit continuously and monitor multiple patients across geography. And so same thing can be put in ambulance, making it an e-ambulance so that during the transport, uh, because of, you know, the traffic issues, so we can actually save many lives within that first half an hour, one hour of transport. And then uh, the uniqueness is because uh, the platform is such robust. For example, the technology used is same thing which is used in Facebook, LinkedIn. So it enables building AI, machine learning, and blockchain uh, to uh, build predictive analytics and treat uh, patients. So what are the key use pieces? It's not expensive because of the platform which we use. It's IoT based. Then it's easy to use. And then it's uh, not device specific. So any vendor, any device, we're ready to uh, hook on. Then 
interface. So interface, we have multiple systems can be interface, multiple devices, then modalities, audio, video, anything. So anything which we give, which is interfaceable, we can interface. And flexibility, uh, because it's highly scalable because of the platform, any HL7, non-HL7, so these are all standards within healthcare we can uh, do. And then it's smart because it sends device alerts which we can customize and use uh, different uh, latest technologies to enable the care smartly. So uh, looking at revenue model, uh, so we have different revenues, so look CapEx model wherein uh, upfront cost or in SaaS model, so uh, we can use block, we are using uh, block technologies to make, uh, ensure that the safety of the patient, patient data is there and put it on a SaaS model or we can use hybrid of this. And of course we can have value added services uh, into that. So what are, what are the key value proposition of our solution? So it can inter interface with existing hospital legacy systems. So any legacy system which is possible, we can interface. Then it helps in automation of device data collection because of the integration of devices. Then of, so because of this, there is very uh, chances of reducing medical errors. So again, uh, looking at Dabawala, we also want uh, basically have in healthcare ideal scenario is uh, zero errors. Then looking at the human resource aspect, so it increases a lot of efficiency. So the doctor, one specialist doctor can monitor multiple ICs across geography, so, and also enables mobility because of this. And uh, since we use IoT, it avoids heavy infrastructure or IT infrastructure dependencies. So it reduces the cost. And then further analytics can reduce mortality by crisis prevention, so the doctor can actually uh, identify that the patient may go into crisis beforehand and then prevent that. And then through this, it improves the clinical outcomes and improves patient experience. And, and finally, like, like last speech we heard, it's customer is a god, so for us patient. So we ideally want to bring down the cost to the patient ultimately. Even uh, it can reach to the base of error within tier two, tier three cities using this technology. So. This is our team, which I have done this uh, uh, breakthrough. So we have over 45 years of healthcare domain expertise, tech, health tech experience of around 40 years and 30 years of device uh, int integration expertise. So that's it. So thank you, uh, thank you Apollo for giving this opportunity here. And I just want to reinforce that yes, we are uh, delivering information uh, accurately without any error from the doctors from the patients to doctors and back. So, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our next session, which is the big debate on the topic, the patient is always right. May I please call upon stage the chairpersons for this debate, Dr. Hari Prasad and Dr. Anupam Sibbal. I'll take a minute of your time to attend Apollo Hospitals, Navi, Mumbai. Against the motion we have, Dr. Suresh Ramasubham, consultant, Apollo Glenicals Hospital, Kolkata, and Mr. Gaurav Loria, head quality and administrator, Apollo Hospitals Group. May I please request the chairpersons to take over the session. Good morning, what a session this morning. I think it's been an amazing beginning to day two. I mean, from what Mike said, to what Mark said, to what Peter said, and then of course what Bhavanji said, captivating the audience on how is it that you can achieve excellence and you don't always need technology, you don't need resources, you don't need higher education, but you just need a commitment. We now move on to the big debate. And the debate is, is the patient always right? Or actually, the patient is always right. Let me remind you what Mahatma Gandhi had said about clients. A customer is the most important visitor on our premises. He's not dependent on us. We are dependent on him. He's not an interruption in our work. He's the purpose of it. He's not an outsider in our business. He's a part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him. He is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. Doesn't this apply to patients? Yes? Yes? We want our patients to be happy. Really happy. 
this happy. We want our patients and doctors to love each other, hug each other, be so close to each other. But quite often they're like this, right? We want them to see eye to eye. We want them to have a meaningful deliberation. But quite often it's like this. The doctor thinks, you know, I've done this for 20 years, 30 years, I know it all, I'm so experienced. You know, I'm the one who's really driving care. And the patient says, yeah, you might have been doing it for 30 years, but it's my body. It's my unique DNA. So I know everything about myself. You know, when a patient gets diagnosed with a condition, and these days it's really hard for patients because they immediately go on to Google, and then they imagine if you have a slight swelling in the neck and it's a lymph node, instead of thinking of an infection or tuberculosis, you think of lymphoma. Because you go on to Google and you type that and that's what you'll get. And then if you have the diagnosis, then you actually type prognosis and then you will get the worst po possible prognosis. And so when a patient comes to a doctor, a patient's really worried. The patient is imagining the worst. That's how the human mind is programmed. You always don't think of the best scenario, but quite often you think of the worst scenario. And actually, if you go on to Google and if you type diabetes, you get 29 million hits. Hypertension, you get 58 million hits. And breast cancer, you get 15 million hits. So that's the kind of information available. And it's really tough for doctors because if a doctor goes on to PubMed and types diabetes, there are 600,000 published peer-reviewed papers on diabetes, 454,000 on hypertension, and 350,000 on breast cancer. So things are difficult for doctors as well because there's just so much information available. So what the doctor has to do is to balance knowledge, balance experience, expertise, look at the patient in totality, and then decide on what's the best modality of treatment. But in today's world, this is what happens. The dentist told me I need a crown. I was like, I know, right? So to, to debate, we have four stellar speakers. The rules of engagement, each debater gets seven minutes, seven precise minutes to put forward their viewpoint. So we have four debaters, so that's 28 minutes. Then we will have three minutes each for both sides. Now, by the end of this session, when I ask this question, how many of you believe patient is not right, all of you will lift your hands up. Okay, now we'll divide, now this is not going to be about these four people or six people sitting on the stage, it's going to be about all of you. So I want to make sure I, because I'm taking the tough part of it, which is we're talking against the motion, if you want to call it, where the patient was not right. And I'm sure he'll, and that would be the more interesting thing, you were all heard patient is right, patient is right, patient is right all the time. But what will be more interesting is to hear why the patient is not right. Right? Yes. Where's the noise? Yes. Okay. And then Dr. Ran Subban is an intensivist from Apollo Hospitals, uh, Calcutta. And uh, of late, he's faced a lot of uh, situations which I'm sure will make him passionately speak that the patient is always not always right. And then we have Gaurav, who was uh, a great part of organizing this whole thing. So before actually starting the debate and getting onto the side, I think it deserves a big round of applause along with the rest of the team. And this is for him and the rest of the team who put this show together. It's been fantastic two days here in Bombay. So he is actually, he works with me, he's my boss. And he tells me what to do most of the time. How many of you are MBAs in the hall? More on this side. So I always believe that MBAs know a little less than. <laughs> and he proved it just now on stage, right? He was not an MBA, so he proved it on stage, so this side has more MBA, so I, I'm more confident that. <laughs> and after they speak, 
Anupam introduces the speakers and after they speak, I'm going to come down and be prepared to speak passionately on this side, why the patient is not always right, and on this side, why the patient is always right. And we have special gifts for them, not the topis and the dabbas, <laughs> but something else very special. Okay? Are you ready to have fun? Hey, thank, th thank you very much, Hari. And um, I'd like to draw your attention to two or three points that uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Hari Prasad, has made. The first thing he's done is divided the house, <laughs> right? And we've seen that over and over. We've seen that over decades play out in our country, right? But we are not divided, so no one can divide us. <laughs> and the second thing we have to note is... Anupam, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> eight minute, eight minute. Is there anybody from the media here? <laughs> no, no. Nobody from the media, no? All of you know of one television anchor. <laughs> you know whom I'm referring to, no? <laughs> huh? The nation wants to know. <clears throat> right? I am going to be the nation wants to know. And you will see me exactly like what he does. Anupam was going to talk some... Uh, that is exactly what I did right now, isn't it? And I'm going to continue to do that. And this side is going to make more noise and make sure that that side is not heard at all. Okay. Okay? So, so you notice that some people don't give up about their divisions. So he will continue to try and divide us, but we will continue to remain united because we are an amazing nation that actually believes... Are you substance? <coughs> bolo, ha, not bowling, yes, bowling, yes, bowling. Yes. Substance bowling, eh? but the important thing is about unity and diversity. And I want to touch on that because if you notice, look at the constitution of his team. Where is the gender the equality? The nation wants to know Where why is the, the patient Where is the gender equality? Where is the gender equality? Right? Bo, bo, bo. How many ladies in this room? Right? Right? So we believe in inclusiveness. We believe in unity and diversity and we will get cracking with the debate and for the motion we have two stellar speakers Dr. Sandhya Majumdar who is the Deputy Director of uh, Medical Services and Clinical Governance at the National University Hospital in Singapore, a very respected healthcare provider in, in, in Asia and Dr. Ram Chadda who is uh, an orthopedic and a spine surgeon and is a very gifted surgeon, gifted not just with his hands but also with intellect. So we will start. Or but and we before will that, the nation in the customer being God and the customer being always right. They're not, to the, they're not synonymous, right? In market world, nowadays healthcare has become a market. So customer or patient, we are treating our patients like customers, right? So that is where customer is God and Dr. Agrawal has proven it. So I think I can rest my case right here because he has spoken so brilliantly that I don't have any case to make. Do you agree with me? Maybe these people won't, but they will. Mitigate this improved communication is what we need and it's very essential. It is also essential for us to know as healthcare professionals that we do not know everything. We do not know something that a patient or his family member knows because they care for the patient and that is what is instinct. And if we were to systematize communication because we want to consider patient's agenda and unmet expectation because we are on the path to patient-centered care and earlier on somebody was asking, there were two questions about patient-centered care and we are moving towards that. So all the more it is very essential for us to listen to the patient's voice. This is another sad story of a young female who had a simple abdominal surgery and her and her family's concerns were unheard during post-op recovery and the patient uh, suffered and she died. These are various uh, points in the patient's journey when the communication and also understanding the viewpoints of patients becomes very essential for us to know. 
Any unexpected things that can come across can be told to us by patients or their families, and any misunderstanding can happen at any of these things. When patients, the concordance and harmony can be reached only when patients are given a full chance, opportunity to express their concerns. And concordance is understood only when you give chance to them to talk. Can anybody tell me how much time does a doctor give to the patient before they, can, they are interrupted? Oh, that's great. You have read the article that goes to show. It's less than 18 to 23 seconds when he stops the patient from his initial comment that he starts to make. If the doctor would have held his tongue and given six more seconds, the patient would have finished completing his concerns and his uh, agenda at all. Basically, it will give you a satisfied patient, good clinical outcomes, and a correct diagnosis if we allow patients to talk. But first and foremost, we need to understand, because this term patient is always right, is very much misunderstood. We must know what this is not. We should know that it is not that we should give in to the wish list of uh, patients as it is, whatever they want. It is also doesn't mean that they are the experts, but it is what we mean is two-way communication where we need to hear the patients and also we need to tell them the consequences of their wish list and also what we can offer to them. That is the basic, and saying no to them does not mean that they are not right, but they may be misinformed. Another thing is that what we have to do, this two-way communication means we have to make sure that the balance of power in health system is ensured. And currently the healthcare does not have an equal balance. We need to shift the balance from the healthcare providers to the patient and the family members. And what for that particular purpose, what we need is to change our paradigm. We need to shift our paradigm from paternalistic healthcare model to the one which is patient-centered care, where we can recognize and respond to the patient's values, needs, and preferences, and by engaging them and allowing them to speak for their concerns and their viewpoints as well. And of course, how much time do you think doctors and nurses spend with their patients? Very little. In inpatient area, there is more contact as compared to the outpatient areas. So basically, who knows best about their patients? It's themselves, they know their problems well, or their family members or loved ones. They are the ones who know best. So basically, what we need to know, and it's not a question of quantity of time. It's all the question of quality of time that we spend with our patients to understand problems, which we don't do often. Other than that, in case if we want to move towards the patient-centered care, we have to make sure we have to engage patients and activate them. And at the same time, we have understood basically that if we were to focus on activation and engagement, we will be able to manage them better and have better patient outcomes as well. So there is a bridge. There is a bridge in case if we want to move towards patient-centered uh, patient care, we must ensure that there should be a bridge between these two ideas and also between the true controversies that we have. The bridge where the physicians bring the training and clinical expertise and patients bring their life's experience and their unique perspective on needs and priorities. And we believe that medicine cannot achieve its potential if it ignores the voice of thinking patients. And this is, I leave you with the, these kind of words to ponder over. Patient-powered healthcare is no insult to clinicians. We should try to listen to them, pay heed to them. We should break open the shackles of the paternalistic healthcare model. It is very difficult for people in India to understand this particular patient-centered care model where you understand that patient is right. Why? Because every other day a doctor in some part of the, in, in India is getting beaten up. Their offices are getting ransacked or set on fire. So if you engage your patients in the right way, hear them the right voice, you will reduce these number of events that will happen. So believe me, if you engage your patient and consider them as, not as God maybe, but at least engage them on an equal basis, you will achieve a better outcome for your patients than this. With this, I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sandhya. And over to uh, for against the motion. Now, uh how much time did we say the uh, doctor actually listens to a patient? 18 seconds. So how much time does a husband listen to the wife? 
Any guesses? Huh? Lifetime. 18 seconds? 18 seconds. I, I think. <laughs> okay, Ram Subban is all ready to go. Let him go ahead. Uh, my slides, please. All right. Um, uh, I think. Um, no, I think uh, that is not me. That is half of me, Ram only. Uh, I can okay. speak. No. <laughs> I can destroy. <laughs> All right. Um, I think by, by the time the slides are loading, uh, just a quick question. We all say uh, God's a, patient is a God, customer is a God. Does anybody know why Kalima is walking naked and has her tongue sticking out? Because she's not right. She just stepped on her sleeping husband. Why does Shivji roam around drinking bhang? Is he right? Do you, do you all say drinking alcohol is fine? I don't think so. So I think what I'm going to do here is I want to destroy that patient is always right on three bases, a scientific basis, a moral or an ethical basis, and a business question. And I wanted to put an end to this business question of patient is always right. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to do that. With due respect to the fact that we want to attain patient-centered care. All right. So let's, when we want to be scientific, we always want to define things. What is right? Right means as confirming to facts or truth. All right, getting out facts or getting out truth is difficult from a patient. Anybody who has taken a history for 18 seconds also will let you know it is not easy. Patient gas hoche. This is the commonest complaint that every lady in this part of the world will have. And gas can mean anything from a cardiovascular accident to a heart attack. It is not easy in 18 seconds to find out what is right. So let's not talk about that. Do patients always come up and say, doctor, I have hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis? No, they don't come with that. So it is not possible. And they diagnose themselves on the internet and they do it wrong. So they don't know what is always happening to them. So scientifically, it is not possible for me to believe that the patient can ever be right. Patient can be right in symptoms. But I'm going to give you this instance. Can anybody recognize what this fruit is? Chinese star fruit. It's called Kar Kamranga in Bengal or Assam or Bangladesh. So this is a patient who presented to us with abdominal pain and said, gas, 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 complain, medical board, blah, 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 dialysis requirement. Why? Because he refused to, and he kept on eating this fruit. Because we said, don't eat anything, he kept on eating this. What does this contain? Oxalate. What does this cause? Ureteric obstruction. What does this cause? Renal failure. So does a patient always know what is right? Absolutely not. I don't think there should be any doubt that a patient can know the science of medicine. All right. So the question now comes is, is there an ethical, is it ethically possible for the patient to be right? Uh, yes, morality is different. We, God, all this thing is different. You know, how many Cath people have worked in the US and Catholic hospitals won't allow abortions? Is that right for a lot of people? Yes. Is it wrong for a lot of people? Yes. So I don't think abortion is a wrong thing for a lot of us. So morality should not come in between patient care. Ethics means what we want to, how we rate our professional work. So when we talk about ethics, we talk about these things, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and distributive justice. Autonomy means the right to self-determination. I'm going to give you an instance. Ashtami night. Ashtami night. All right, I'm working. And I have a young one and a half year old Muslim, young, I mean, a poor girl from Bihar who comes in with a sepsis and a low flow state and has got her fingers which are blue. And there is a probable aplast syndrome and there is a clot in her right. We say we need to do an angioplasty to open it and we might not be able to save the hand. We might still lose the hand. Do you know what the man says? Ladki hai, ek aur paida kar lunga. Do you think we deserve this kind of autonomy? Is this what our country is for? Is this what we can let them? In the US, I would have sent that guy to jail. Do you agree? Yes. Do you think the girl child, if would he have saved if it had been a boy, male child? Yes. But so, autonomy is meant for people who are competent. And I think there is a good issue of whether we are competent or not. Beneficence, to do what is in the best interest of the patient, not what the patient wants. Want and need. My son wants PS4 games all the time. Does he need it? No. Want and needs are different. You will produce Michael Jackson's, doctors giving propofols and dying. Do no harm. That is non-maleficence. I want my painkillers. And you give him morphine and pethidine and you bring him down to the ICU because you overdosed on him. So do not do whatever the patient wants. Do no harm. You know, narcotic addiction is the number one cause of accidental death in the US now. Prince, Michael Jackson, name it. That's where they are. Right. 
do what you do are all patients. No, we do VIP treatment. No, we cannot be possible, isn't it? The last question I want to bring down this house is, is this a business question? Where did this word customer is always right came from? 1909, Harry Gordon Selfridge, from the Selfridge department store who invented this term. And this is what has caught on. But I think hospitals should abandon this phrase once and for all. Ironically, because it leads to worse patient care. The five reasons why the patient is always right is wrong. It makes employees unhappy. I'm not talking about doctors. I am talking about the nurses, the healthcare assistant, the ward boy, and everybody else. Don't make healthcare a doctor issue. We only deliver a fraction of the healthcare. Majority of the healthcare is delivered by whom? Thank you very much. So make it about the employees. It gives patient, abrasive patient, an unfair advantage. You know, some patients are just bad for businesses. Let them go. You know, just let them go. It results in worse patient service, and it's a problem. So this is what the CEO of Continental Airlines said. When we run into customers that we can't reel back in, our loyalty should be with our employees. The patient always rides squarely favors the customers, which is a bad idea. Because as Bethune said, it causes resentment amongst you. Because if I have to snub you, my CEO is sitting here and he tells you, no, no, Dr. Suresh, you shouldn't talk like this. You should, he's right. He snubs me down. He snubs an employee. He makes me unhappy. And this is not going to Put the customer second. Put your people first. And then you will watch them kick butt. <laughs> All right. So put the customer second, post employees first, and they will be happy at work. If your employees are happy, they will care more about other people, including the patient. They will talk more to the patient. They are happy, meaning they are more fun to talk to and interact with. If I'm afraid that my CEO is going to say, why, Dr. Suresh, are you doing this? I don't even want to talk to the patient. They are more motivated. So it is important that I do not create an unhappy employee. An unhappy employee means he's not valued. Treating employees fairly is not important. Employees have no respect, uh, no right to respect from patients. It is assumed because you put customers first. That means he can abuse me. He can do whatever he wants, isn't it? Employees have to put up from everything. Pani garam kyo nahi hai. You know, so whatever it is. Employee disillusionment. What do you do? Genuinely good service is not possible, so what do I do? Yes, madam. That's what I'm going to do. So I mean courteous face. Your heart is not going to be good. If your heart is not going to be good, you're not going to be providing patient care. What Mr. Dr. Agarwal said, it is that you have to believe that you're doing good. A doctor's job or a nurse's job is to believe you're doing good, and it is to believe that work is God, not the patient is God. I think if somebody can understand that, I think I cannot find any scientific, ethical, or business reason to put patient first. I just end with saying, Look at this. This is what you will end up with. Thank you very much. Uh, we will end the <laughs> debate here. Should we end the debate here? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah? He has destroyed the argument. Yeah? So, Anupam? No, I'm just Anupam, noticing I'm so, so that, sorry. that Dr. Hari Prasad continues to look at this. The nation already knows. But what happened? The patient is not always right. And whatever lectures come from that side will all be theory, which the nation doesn't want to know. But the interesting thing is how can one individual know that Nothing. the nation what wants to know this or that? Anything I mean, that is the big question. How can Anything one individual sitting decide what the nation wants to do? No, the nation wants to know what they want to know. Even your people are not letting the, uh, letting you, uh, everybody, you be heard. <laughs> They're clapping, making noise while you're talking. So even they are convinced now. Uh, but okay. a, we'll wonder, a, a, yeah, a wonderful argument made by Ram, but what is very interesting is that how he took Mr. Agarwal's words and actually gave them his own flavor. That is being smart. But, 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 we also have to look at what Mr. Agarwal said in truth and absolute truth. One in how many errors did Mr. Agarwal say? 16 million. And why is that? Because for every individual who's a Dabba Wala, work is worship. And that entails making sure 
that the customer gets a delight in every single interaction. I think now, when, 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 when we one actually, minute, one when minute, we actually, one minute, one minute, one minute, when you start to lose, minute, you interrupt. One minute. This is a, this is the habit us, of a particular all, anchor as well, right? Minute. Right? All of us agreed that Mr. Agarwal is on this side, <laughs> and he is actually depending on our side to base his whole argument on. Right. Isn't it? but we'll give them a chance. Right. So we move on, uh, we move on to the next debater and we have Dr. Ram Chadda who is going to speak on the patient is always right. What do you remember in the last 10 minutes? Three words. Gas, gas and gas. Sun rises in the east, no argument, the patient is always right, no argument. Yes. Thank you for supporting me, sir. I love you so much. So this lady walks into your clinic, says she has a painless scoliosis. Would you examine her in your clinic, in your patient's presence? Door open with a lady chaperone, or would you like to get a family member? Well, I would examine her with a lady chaperone. Why would I do that? Because I felt she's right to have reached me. However, this was my patient. Now let's look at a patient who would come to Dr. Hari Prasad. Unhappy relative of a patient who's had post operative adverse event barges in. It's your packed OPD, insists on seeing you immediately. And there's another patient in front of you. Will you stop your consult and see him right there? Maybe they would. You'll, you'll finish your present consult and tell him that, that you can you know, see him right there. You'll ask him to be seated elsewhere and would see him after your present consult. Or maybe, as our worthy opponents, admonish him. Get the support staff from this side to make him wait outside. Well, probably, yes. We would politely have him seated in another room and see him after the present consult. Sir, in life, you got to be charming and you got to be correct. This is how most of our worthy opponents' patients look like. There is complaint, condemnation, comparison, where is the patient? That poor guy in the background. <laughs> For me, this is my patient. There is acceptance, there is appreciation, acknowledgement, and a desire to be treated and felt good. His patients look at Dr. Google before visiting him. Mine don't. These are his patients' relatives who come and threaten him and tell him that my patient needs you. I do not believe in any of these things, sirs. I don't let your behavior or the behavior of my patient's relatives destroy my inner peace. Nurses from this side shouted something, right? Florence Nightingale said something written on line four, 2016 updated. The patient is always right, especially when satisfaction scores are involved. Yes, nurses, clap, clap, come on. My teacher told me, you do not study to pass the test. You study to prepare for the day when you're the only thing between the patient and the grave. For me, it's just the patient, not the relative, not these people seated on this side at all. <laughs> Gentlemen, because you don't have a lady on your side, unfortunately, <laughs> you need to think, pause, reconsider. There are essential communication skills which you need to learn. Be frank with your patient. It's an art. You can still learn it, sir. It's a lifelong pursuit. You still got a long way to go. All of us 
are not born equal. But all of us have an equal opportunity to develop our talents. You still have a chance. Please try. <laughs> Most patients, more than two-thirds of them, can be managed without medication, not that gas, gas, gas. <laughs> you need just advice and counseling. Hear them out. They are telling you what's wrong with them. You're not even willing to hear them out. Depression and anxiety are the most common problems. Most of our doctors, unfortunately, on this side are suffering because of that. <laughs> well, you should also go for specialized and skilled consultations, I believe. Nothing in this world can bother you as much as your own mind, sir. In fact, others seem to be bothering you, but it's not the others. It's your own mind. And why is that so? Because you guys think from your mind. You got to think from your heart. We as doctors have a purpose. <laughs> These healthcare professionals have processes. Purpose says touching the feet of the patient, and he is always right. Listen to the patients, respect their views, have open communication with them, discuss their options, allow them to ask as many questions, ensure that they understand. Be aware of their local language. Don't say they're coming from Singapore. So what? There are Indians there. Accept the cultural influences. Compensate. Use communication skills. Not just gas, gas, gas. <laughs> Best form of service, and which I'm trying to do, is uplift somebody's state of mind. I hope three people, the only three who disagree, would soon feel uplifted. <laughs> there is a lot much more than what I'm speaking. You have to have an open, attentive posture. You weren't even having eye contact with me, trying to convince me, sirs. Even now you're shunning away. Come on. I love you. You're listening to me, sir. I love you so much. You've allowed me to tell my entire story without interruption. God bless you. <laughs> sir. The problem is your mind. <laughs> you are a servant of your mind. I am a master of my mind. <laughs> you should be empathetic. I'm going to hug you after this presentation. <laughs> it allows more effective care. You need an empathetic doctor, sir. Look at the patient's perspective. Develop trust. Understand my story. You already announced the result before I came to speak. Well, these are psychosocial factors. <laughs> have trust in what I'm saying. You have technology on your side, so what? Knowledge, skill, and attitude. Where's the attitude gone, sir? <laughs> it's an attitude of gratitude. We've got to be grateful to our patients. They are the ones who've allowed us to be called doctors. Learn this one thing, never above you, never below you, always besides you. <laughs> Sometimes in life it's better to be kind than to be right. We do not always need to be intelligent. Well, these intelligent men say that. Just a patient heart that listens. Leave the mind aside. Compassion is always right. Please believe that for the rest of your lives. The patient has sacrificed his privacy, control over most topics of his life when he's entrusting his entire life to us. We owe it to them, sir. We owe it to them. They are right. Patient values come above everything else is secondary. Your research, your, your clinical data. No, sir. They do not matter. It's the values of my patient. Be gentle like you are now being with me. I appreciate the change. I love the way that your mindset has been changed. Thank you so much for believing now that it's better to be kind than to be right. That they, they're not treating patients. <laughs> that was a part of his presentation. He said he only treats patients 
who do not go on to the Google and look for information, right? Yes. Is there any pay? No. You can you can go back and look at his presentation. Today, is there a patient who comes without Googling? So, we don't have to pay too much attention to those people who are not treating patients and who are Googling to come up with presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And invite May I please hug you before I go? All the time. <laughs> And now, now are we going to have Gaurav? One minute. We need some security around. <laughs> There's some beautiful girls here, and a very handsome man is going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of people from this side also are bound to move to this side <laughs> by the time he finishes speaking. Gaurav, so, go over, Gaurav, against the motion, your time starts now. So, enough of stories, enough of Gyan. Let's move on to some actual scenarios, some data, and some questions which I will ask you towards the end of the session. So I would start my, uh, my part of the story saying patient is always first, but not always right. So there was this old lady who walks into the uh, a clinic of a doctor. There's a junior doctor sitting there, and then she says, uh, the, the junior doctor recognizes the lady and says, Madam, you are here back again. The lady says, Yes, I have a problem. I need a second opinion and there is nobody who is helping me. You know, I've got this bad headache for the last one week and I know I've got brain tumor, but nobody is helping me and telling me what exactly should I do for that. The doctor said, Madam, if you give me some time, let me do the physical examination, order some tests if required, and then come to a, you know, a preliminary diagnosis. The lady says, no, you know I'm always right. So I, this is the, my situation and this is what I'm telling you. And the customer is always right. The doctor says, Madam, I understand what you are saying, but you're not my customer and I'm not selling you anything. I am the doctor and it's my moral obligation to provide care to you and not to sell you anything. The lady, uh, the lady uh, further says, I saw that, you know, one board put outside that you say that it's my right to know and it's my right to take a decision for what I do. Yes, madam, I know it is your right, but I can only explain it to you and cure your problem. It is not because I don't want to do it or I don't want to explain it, but it is because you are not giving me time to explain you what exactly it is. So that's the today's uh, story. If I look onto the internet, as we discussed before, as per the statistics, it says four out of five patients who come to a hospital, they do the reviews, they do the Google, and then they come to a hospital or they, then they go to a doctor. I had some itching on my hand. I looked onto internet. The condition is called pruritus. And, you know, it sounds very scary. There are 70 symptoms. There are 70 types of pruritus. So, which could lead if not corrected, uh, you know, if not corrected at that point of time, it could be from a simple allergic reaction to a cancer to a uh, STD. So, and either ways it doesn't work. It, it is no fun. As per the again statistics, it is said that, you know, there are three times in a year on an average, any person visits a doctor while people spend at least 52 hours in a year Google, doing Google or checking what, what their health condition is or on the data, you know, uh, what, what to do in case of a particular problem. So, my question is, is patient an actually a customer? And is hos our hospitals a service industry? Or they are neither a product or a health service industry, but they are a special industry which should be treated differently and the patient is not a customer and should be treated differently as anybody else. So, some of the critical points which we need to consider here is patients are not on a vacation. That they expect, they want, whatever they want. Patients are not buying a product and from which they can demand a positive outcome. See, the outcomes are not always positive. It could be a negative outcome, it could be a mortality. But does that actually mean that if it's a negative outcome, that nothing has been done for that patient? Does that mean that the doctor has not done anything or the hospital has not done anything for that patient? I seriously feel it's not the case. Patient demands are all not always right. 
we already discussed it before, there is, a, there is a huge difference between a need and a want. What the patient needs is completely different from what the patient wants. It's the responsibility of the doctor to provide what the patient needs, provide him the right kind of care what the patient needs, and not for all the host of services and the host of other things that the patient wants. And patient satisfaction does not always correlate with the quality of the product. This is also what we need to consider and make sure that we know about it. Today, if you, look, if, if, you know, if a lot of organizations, if we look at what is happening is all these positive reviews or the negative reviews around the hospitals, around the doctors, there are certain organizations where they are driving the salaries and the incentives. So at the end of the day, is it the outcome or is it the patient satisfaction that we are looking at that drives the outcomes? Or how does that whole work is the big, bigger question. So some other points which are again very critical is quality of service versus quality of care. So are we looking at the care that we are delivering or are we looking at the service that we are delivering or is it both? I don't think it is both because it always ends up with the patient satisfaction, whether the patient has given us a score of 8, 9 or 10 or NPS scoring or whether the patient has given us 1, 2, 3. How many of us are actually looking at the outcomes and saying that, okay, this is a good doctor because his outcomes are good, this is a good doctor because his outcomes are world class, rather we are saying that this is a good doctor who has a good patient feedback. Doctors, and this ends up, this results sometimes doctor doing things to please the patients which they should not do in their best interest. And this also helps, you know, gets them deviated from the actual goal, what they should do. And also please remember medicine is just an art. It is a small part of the science and the probability. I go to my doctor, there are a lot of times that it has happened personally with me. I go to my doctor and I tell him that sir, I've got this bad cold, I have taken cetirizine, nothing happened to me. Can you please give me an antibiotic because I need to work and I can't take this. And he gives me an antibiotic. Just because he wants to please me, just because I am asking for it, or do you think an antibiotic is required for that kind of a situation for a simple small problem? So these are the things which we need to look at. My questions which I want to ask you is, someone who reads internet expects a five star hotel treatment in a restaurant and in a hospital and the best quality service at the cheapest cost, while also grumble to pay for the doctor's time and utilization of the hospital's resources and he still wants a discount. Someone who doesn't mind spending 3,000 rupees, you know, in watching a movie or about 30,000 rupees for a two-day holiday, but questions the hospital for charging him 500 rupees for a blood test when, hospital is when the hospital resources are being utilized for this service. And never ask for a discount when, you, when, we, when these, the same people, when they go and buy, you know, uh, from a hypermarket or a Chinese rest, or they eat food in a Chinese restaurant. So do you think he's right and he's always right? Do we physically manhandle and beat up the restaurant if the food is stale or if we find food in the, uh, we find hair in our food? Do we do that? Do we break the class, uh, glasses of a car showroom when we go and, you know, just because that we have bought a, a 20, 20 lakh car and it breaks down more often than expected, do we go and break the, you know, glasses of that showroom? Do we go into the media and say that the garments that I have bought or the shirts that I have bought is of no worth, it doesn't work? Do we do all these? then why do we go and we break the glasses of the hospital? Why do we go and, you know, manhandle the doctors, manhandle the nurses, manhandle yeah. other healthcare professionals? Why do we go into the media for every small thing just because we feel, just because we feel that healthcare, we can do anything and all the hospitals, all the doctors are obligated to provide us the service. Why do we feel that, you know, it, it, why, do, why don't we realize that there are resources involved in it why don't we realize it's not a charity? It is, it is a lot of work that goes into providing those resources. It goes a lot of education that gets into this whole system. Why don't we realize that? And do we still think the patient is right and always right? That was my case. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Anupam, give me on a serious note, on a serious note, because I had to say that otherwise you would have started talking. On See, a serious old note, habits don't one change. minute, one minute, one minute. Why does a patient come to the hospital? To get treated, right? Not to look at what the doctor looks like or whether he's talking, smiling. He doesn't come for that, isn't it? So the basic summary of the whole story is these people are treating patients. <laughs> right?
Feel them better. These patients, one minute, let me complete and then you can intervene because the nation is not knowing the truth. <laughs> these people are treating patients, their clinical outcomes are better, but nobody comes and breaks down their hospital, nobody beats them up. They don't have patients. <laughs> they are happy to get beaten up by the patient. They are happy to be, they have their hospital broken down by the patient. Okay? That is the summary of the whole story. And you can give a big round of applause for the people who are treating the patient. Come on. Come on. So even they are clapping. All right. So, even they are uh, clapping. No. But I'll tell you one more thing. The last thing, <laughs> the last thing, my team on this side is much more passionate about what they're doing because right. they're actually handling the patients right. and right. treating them. So let's see who talks passionately, your team or my team. Okay. Let me go uh, down. But, um, but before we do but that. Before, but before that, <laughs> see, I want You know, there's a particular no, 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 program. They minute. have eight panelists, eight but minute. the panelists never get to speak, one right? One minute. The nation wants to know. What Mr. Agarwal thinks about the whole thing. Sara <laughs> Jugade. I can speak on both the sides. No, you're on this side. This side. Udar, you can actually either Ajay. If I'm on this side, if patient is right, then why he goes to doctor? He should call doctor. So I should say patient never right. Sunliana. Can I? Can I? Sunliana. Can I? No, I will ask people, anybody has any reply from your side? Rana, you talk well, so I'm not going to come to you. <laughs> okay. No, I think, you know, uh, it's not whether the patient is right or wrong. I think what we need to look at is, you know, the trust of the patient. The patient needs to trust the doctor. Will the patient trust the doctor more or will he trust the Google more? That is important. So, you know, just one minute. Let me finish. Now, 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 if the trust of the doctor has to be gained, okay, then I need to say that patient is always right. You know, the patient is never wrong. The doctor needs to explain to the patient if the patient is sa saying something which is not correct. What okay. has been said in one line, you can counter in 20 okay. lines. Okay, okay. Now, I just wanted now, to uh, hurry, hurry before uh, we open it up, just, just one uh, yeah, 30 seconds. And I know 30 seconds we'll is very hard for you. Uh, but, uh, but what did Mr. Agarwal say? The reason why Dabawalas are Dabawalas because they work as one team. And if you notice, your team actually gave conflicting messages. Dr. Ram said, I want to demolish this myth about healthcare and business, but your other debater only talked about business. Cyber Mart, Chinese restaurant, holiday, 500 rupees, 5,000 rupees. So the team must speak one language or it's not a team, right? But so Anupam, what we're going to do Anupam, now is, Hari is going to walk around, Hari, a couple of questions here because we're running short of time and then we'll do a rebuttal from whoever wants to do. Right. One question from here, one from there, right? Yeah, but you're still going to get a rebuttal from me. Of course. <laughs> what we speak... Sorry? What we speak... Yes. ...will be only a reflection of what you speak. <laughs> so we you've given to, up, right? We, we had to I mean, you'll always be a follower. We had to reply to you, so we had to use that language. Sure, okay, of course. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Varsha. I'm talking on neutral side. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm neither same saying patient approach. is right or a doctor is right. It depends upon the depth of the knowledge of the patient and the depth of the knowledge of a doctor. Obviously, doctor has a more knowledge. He has Before that, where are you from? I'm from Mumbai right now. So you can contest elections here. You have a good no, chance no, no. of winning let the me, election. No, no, no. Let me finish, sir. Okay, Please, go let ahead, me go finish. Ahead. That'll be hard. It is <laughs> half of the time. Patient is also right when the doctor doesn't have complete knowledge. And we need to agree to that. There are certain things which every single doctor cannot know. It doesn't mean that patient is also right that he has Googled. But certainly, if you have a specialized knowledge in particular subject, 
you can definitely with your knowledge shut the patient's mouth definitely you can do that and that is what where sometimes we need to understand even doctor is right and the patient is right there is no debate that who is right it is the outcome of a patient and outcome of doctor what he is giving that makes sense i think thank okay. you very much anybody you. from this side I am here to say that when a patient is considered a customer, he will always be in doubt of the services which is provided to him and will always be asking for a discount and show dissatisfaction even if he gets the best of the services. So I go with this team. Right. Okay. I know yeah. with that team. Any other, any? Okay. okay. No, now we have already passed time. Okay. So see, this is what happens, you know. When no. you are losing a debate, you say the time no, is no, up no. now. One minute. Right? Yeah. I mean, we know that, don't we? We see that on television every day, right? The no. we we have. What does he say? He says. Uh, <laughs> see. He says something. See, original thinking is missing. Please observe. I wanted him to say that, but uh, we'll give one chance to them and one chance to them, and then conclude. You can do it from here. I love you, sir. Please be seated, sir. <laughs> so your team and you spoke about He'll wants. Hold on, be careful. You'll fall that side. Come this side. For a change, you started caring about me. Oh, I love yes, you. <laughs> You were talking about wants and needs. I'm going to show the difference between those wants and needs to you. So your team is looking at the patient. We are seeing the patient. Your it's team... Mein hai, looking, seeing. That's exactly where I'm coming. You people are hearing what we are saying. You're not listening to what we are saying. Again. <laughs> ye bhi mein hai, hearing, listening. You people are looking at the level of sympathy. We are talking at the level of empathy. Sympathy, empathy. Patient is coming for treatment here, not for sympathy or empathy. Pilot, up dabba dete na pehle. Uske baad sympathy or empathy or jo bhi hota hai, uske baad hota hai. प्यार होता है वो भी बाद में होता है सर आप हिंदी में बोल रहे हैं तो मैं भी हिंदी में बोल रहा हूं सर आप लोग क्रिया कर रहे हैं बंगाली में मत बोलो आप बस यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड द पेशेंट्स लैंग्वेज आप क्रिया कर रहे हैं हम लोग कर्म कर रहे हैं आई वुड रेस्ट माय केस विद जस्ट वन लाइन We've tried to change what we could change. We will accept what we cannot change. <laughs> and hopefully everybody will rise above those who are not acceptable. Thank you so much. Sir. One minute. Before uh, Ram Subban speaks, I think, uh, if, uh, words, <coughs> if words can heal a yeah. patient, yeah. Then they are the best doctors in the world. Thank you. Oh, Thank yes. you. Words can heal the patient. They Dr. don't Hari know Prasad. how to write a prescription. They don't know how to do surgery. So non-practicing doctors, it continues. Go ahead, you, Ram. You know why I'm afraid of lawyers? Because lawyers do this. They have no facts. They go in front of the judges. They strut their talents and they give fab no facts and they prove us wrong. It's so that's exactly why I'm wrong. So yes, if you are a debater, you have to stick to the facts. I, so have they showed you any scientific evidence that the patient is right? Have they showed you any ethical argument that the patient is right? Have they shown you any business advantage? No. So, so let me just say that the rebuttals are, they, can, they are just picking up on what we are saying. It's like chasing a tail. They are actually chasing our tail. Whatever I say, now he'll say gas, gas, gas. He'll say lawyer, <laughs> this is not possible. This is just not possible. This is not how you do an argument. If any of your children are going for debating skills, please do not teach this. Dr. Ramasubham, I want to say one thing before I can. Excuse me for taking up this opportunity. But basically, it seems like your side, you don't want to give up your upper hand in healthcare system. You even want to take help of God, Kali Ma. Right? 
and even you went to the extent of comparing shirts with lives. Shirts are shirts, lives are lives, you know. That's a different thing. And he also went to the extent of saying a handsome man is there and he was trying to attract the nurses for the votes they want to win. <laughs> He's a very good politician. So we'll see a if that really made a difference or not. Yeah. But then I seriously feel that whatever they have been talking about is all about the frills around the care rather than the actual care and the outcomes. So our, our point is that we should focus on the outcomes rather than the frills and all the extra things that we make around, you know, get around the patient and spend all our resources on that and compromise sometimes. There are times when you compromise, for example, on the nursing strength in the, in the hospital just because you have to spend money on all the frills around to take care of the patient. But is that the right thing? Is that the right move to do it? I don't think it is right. So patient is not always right. Thank you so much. Good morning, um, I'm talking against as well. So um, uh, in one situation when we know, uh, especially in quarantine, a patient is suffering from communicable disease, he doesn't want to get quarantined. We already know that patient is not right there. Secondly, there is a situation where, uh, uh, for example, in rehab, we know patient is not right. We are thinking of his well-being in, uh, in a better way in, for whole the society. So for infections and uh, rehab, we are thinking for a larger picture. So patient cannot be right in that case. And thirdly, uh, there are cases where we don't get patients. Uh, my father took uh, this medicine, so I also want to take same medicine. So patient is uh, actually, healthcare is evolving. So we also have to evolve. So uh, according to me, patient is an integral part of healthcare. He is also a healthcare team. So we have to involve him as a uh, part of our team to collaboratively uh, design his regimen, whatever it is. Brilliant. Thank you. I think what she said is perfect. She said the patient is a part of the team and there's nobody right or wrong within a team. Everybody is right. That's what she said. That's brilliant. Anybody from this side? Okay. Empty, no, empty boxes. I didn't say you were empty. I just wanted that sentence to be completed. As we talked about regarding uh, caring for our patients, when you are talking about caring, somebody told from that end, that when it comes to caring, you have to listen to your patient. And as Dr. Ram said, said nurses are not there, so we have to improve the strength of the nurses. If you do not want to, I mean, if you want caring from your side, Dr. Ram, that means you are saying that nurses should be uh, included more in the healthcare system so that there is somebody to listen 24-7 to your patient. Correct? Otherwise, you can have only robots over there. Robots can do your job. But 24-7, nurses will do listening to your patient and that will reduce... I'm a nurse. And when you have somebody listening to you, I think 100% of the uh, disease condition of your patients comes down to 0% because you are listening to him. There's absolutely no question that the nurses are the most important part of the care continuum. And uh, that was told by Ram, Ram and the other speakers also. So give all the nurses in the world a big round of applause. Myself, Dr. Sanjay Pandya. I, doc, for the doctor, patient comes as a complaint. They come with the complaint. Usually what I feel is always complaint is always right. But when you pass on to the histories, like family history, past history, personal history, they may not be right sometimes. They may not disclose the personal history also sometimes. So I think uh, over a period of time, we should uh, develop an art when patient is right and when patient is not right. Yeah. Then you will be able to treat the better way. <laughs> sir, where are you from, sir? I'm Bhavnagar, Gujarat. Gujarat. Modi sahab.
So you are fighting against your own team. Don't do that. I, good, I didn't give you the mic. Good morning, one and all. This is Dr. Arya, Director Jangir Hospital. I would like to second uh, uh, our team uh, with uh, evidence which not only uh, nation has accepted, but world has accepted. That is EFCS, Vineet Nair, HCL chairman, you all, we all know, you know, employee first and client second. That theory has been taught world over. So instead of we only as a doctor taking care of patient, instead of that thousand employees, you know, will worship our God, instead of only one praying God, why not entire organization taking care of employee? Uh, patient. Thank you very much. No, you're not wrong. We need to take care of the patients and the employees also. So you don't have to be hesitant to say that. Hello. You know that I mean, only I mean, only a few panelists are allowed to speak in the panel discussions with particular anchors. Yeah. Myself, Dr. Dinesh Prajapati. I work. No, use the mic there. Please come forward and use the mic. I work there. for government. Of minute, I'm coming there. I'm coming there. I've always worked for government and uh, I would like to quote for uh, uh, House MD, there was a serial back then on uh, HBO. Uh, there is a doctor called uh, Dr. Gregory House, he always says uh, patients always lie. There is another version, patients are always wrong, one thing. And second thing, uh, this is a request for uh, all the corporations over here, that uh, please don't recover the cost of entire ventilator from one single patient in 15 days. It's a request. And we have excellent uh, patient safety conferences, and these are all available on very uh, high premium. So uh, I think there is a margin of a uh, little bit uh, of discounts to the uh, patient. How I hope we could recover the ventilator of cost of the ventilator within 15 days from one patient. Then we would. No, no, we'll go there. Otherwise, they'll say that we are cheating. How do we come there? Coming, coming, coming. I'll be on your side only. <laughs> so with due respect, I have just two points to make. And uh, thank you so much for finally giving me the mic. <laughs> See, this is how power equation work. My first point is that any interaction, any transaction between two people is about power. If we as doctors are professionally qualified in any interaction between the doctor and the patient, the doctor is more powerful. And I was brought up to believe, and it is universally accepted, that in any interaction, the person who is more powerful is vested with more responsibility. So whenever there is a communication taking place, always it will be the doctor's responsibility to ensure that the patient has understood what is being communicated. Let us not start blaming the patient for not understanding. I believe that if the patient is giving a wrong history, the responsibility to elicit the truthful history also lies with the doctor. Yeah. That is yeah. one. The second myth, the second myth, I have commanded two units in Indian Armed Forces. I'm a qualified doctor. I'm an MD in hospital administration. As a leader, I have learned that a leader must not only make the employees happy. Because which employee will be happy if the employees are unemployed or if the customers are abusing the organization or the employee? So if you only start becoming people pleasers, to please your employees, which one of the speakers said, you will be taking your organization to its downfall. The patients will vote by not coming back to your hospital. Your hospital will go into red and it will close down. And the same employees whom you thought you were pampering will be unhappy because they will be unemployed and they would have lost their self-respect. The win-win solution is for the leader to make sure that the employees understand and follow the vision. And the vision has to be patient-centric. It has to be like that. Now, for the next half an hour, I don't have to come on to this side. <laughs> because she's taken enough time. More than what uh, uh, that side has taken so far. 
So I'll walk around and go back there and stay there. One minute. So I have just two contributions. Dr. Harry, I've enjoyed becoming your friend. I do now have to reconsider. <laughs> and my second message as a doctor is to the other doctors in the room that I believe strongly that our role is to be the servants of our community, not the lords over our community. And if we take that attitude, we will soon regather how important the patient really is. I don't mind losing friends for the patient's sake. Because treating patients is the most important part we, of it. We've got Professor Cliff used uh, right there. Oh, right so, there. I'm coming. I'm coming. So Wait Cliff for can me. Move to the mic. Wait for me. And Cliff can move to the mic. <laughs> don't come. Don't come. I'll come there. You're speaking on this side. You're in this side of the hall. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question of the audience. If the patient is always right, where are the patients at this meeting? Hands up, those members are here because they're patients. So the people that know most about themselves are not here. We have to talk to the patients. We have to listen to the patients because that's why we're here. And I think that that's the tone that you're all talking around about, but we're not doing about enough to get the patients to co-design a system that works for their benefit and therefore for ours. Thanks, Cliff. That was brilliant. I think uh, we need uh, to conclude and uh, move on. And uh, you want to say something? Win us in 30 seconds. Uh, I know Dr. Hari is going to kill me for this. Now the nation knows enough. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think this has been a fascinating uh, discussion. So many important points ca have come just, out. One, one minute, one yeah. more minute before you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just want to say this is a great session. But both sides are right. Because the patient is always right, but maybe not about the diagnosis. Sure but always right about what they need in terms of how we treat them. Absolutely. So both sides are right. Thank you. I, I think it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. We've had uh, amazing debaters. Uh, we've had uh, a fantastic uh, anchor. Um, and I think we just need to perhaps close this by remembering what Mike said in the morning. And that was a very powerful slide when he talked about coming from Montana to, to Mumbai. It was about the passenger, and I think we have to make healthcare about the patient. It's not about the patient is always right, it's not about the doctor being right, but it's about the patient needs being met in every single encounter. And I think that's what defines healthcare for tomorrow. Thank you very much for, okay, for be one. Before we break, this side, let's see how much noise it makes at the end of the... Oh. One, two, three. This side. Yeah. Okay, now listen. <clears throat> Together, both the sides, let's see how much we noise we can make. So that is the summary of the debate. Both sides are always right. And me and Anupam are great friends. <laughs> and I, I need to let a secret out to you. Yeah. I need to hug him again. Because when he hugged me, he quietly said, your side is doing a brilliant job. <laughs> I'm not going to give him the mic again. <laughs> and, um, and please uh, note that we have the Honorable Minister. She flew in from Delhi, uh, Ms. Anupriya Patel. She'll be here in uh, 20, 25 minutes. So we have tea outside and please come here at 12.15. We wouldn't want to be late and be disrespectful. Thanks ever so much. Our man.
As we all are stepping out for tea, we request everyone to be seated by 12.15. Couple of things, you can definitely go and have a look. It is about the, you can go and fill in the luck form, which has been added in your kit. Please get it stamped by visiting our stalls and put it in the lucky draw box and win prizes. Also, an important information for the guests staying in the hotel, we request you all to check out during this